This is Nizwayam Dennis Aseto. The budget reading the rules schedule for Thursday this week will proceed as planned after National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi gave the go ahead. In his communication to the House, Muturi emphasized the need for every allowance to be made to ensure the exercise proceeds smoothly despite the final estimates and the 2022 financial bill having not been submitted to the House. Muturi had earlier stated that he would be reluctant to give the go-ahead for Yatani to read the 3.31 trillion shillings budget unless Parliament approves a division of Revenue Bill 2022 that shares revenue between counties and the national government. Meanwhile, the Office of the Auditor General has revealed that counties have accumulated a total of 152.5 billion shillings in pending bills, exceeding the 148.39 billion shillings of standing revenue allocation balance. Auditor General Nancy Gatungu made the revelations during an Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council convened by Deputy President William Ruto at his official residence in Karen. IEBC brings together the Council of Governors, National Treasury and other Government agencies mandated to oversee disbursement of allocation and auditing of public expenditure. Now, voter bribing and mobilization of rented crowds are the main challenges the National Police Service is facing in the build up to the August 9th general election. The government has now warned that there will be no sacred cows in the crackdown on perpetrators of the political violence. This is according to Interior Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matiangi, who spoke when he appeared before the National Assembly Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security. With just 125 days to the general election, the security operators in the country is on high alert over two key election malpractices that might trigger political violence during and after the polls. And Sunai East Member of Parliament, Jeanette Mohammed, and his Mbikasi East counterpart Babuino recorded statements at the Directorate of Criminal Investigations over the attack on Odinga. The two legislators arrived at the DCI headquarters where they recounted their relocation of the incident. Now, the influx of illegal firearms are prone to violence, especially the North Rift region of Baringo and Laikipia has been linked to the never-ending conflict in the war torn zones. Appearing before National Assembly Security Committee, Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matangi attributed these to the political instability in the neighboring countries and counties, which make it easy for bandits to access weapons. The Interior Boss, however, pointed out that there is need for, to look into the character of every conflict as they have been propelled by different reasons, including political competition, land conflict, or even fight for resources. And Kalenjin elders have apologized to Azimio presidential candidate Raila Odinga of an incident in Soy where his helicopter was stoned and destroyed. The elders said such hooliganism is not in the culture of the community and called on authorities to publish and punish the perpetrators who stoned Raila's chopper at Cabenes in Wasingeshu as the former Prime Minister headed to the funeral of Zaikun farmer Jackson Kibor. The elders led by the spokesperson of the Kalenjin Council of Elders in Wasingeshu, Edwin Chipsinor, visited Kibor's home and the scene where the incident occurred. And finally, Wiper leader Kalonzo Musioka says no amount of stoning will hinder their resolve to sell the agenda of the Azimio La Umoja One Kenya Alliance Coalition Party in regions where they are perceived to be unpopular. While referring to last week's incident where former Prime Minister Raila Odinga's chopper was stoned in Wasangishu County, Musioka expressed optimism that before August 9th, they would have won the votes of the majority of people who do not believe in their cause. He observed that the warm reception they continue to receive across different parts of the country is indicative of the impending victory that will see Odinga sworn in as Kenya's fifth president. And Newswire continues to urge all Kenyans, those who are listening, those within and without, to continue maintaining peace during this campaigning and political season. Take care of your friend, take care of your neighbor. Let peace prevail because Kenya will exist and will still be here after the August 9th general election. Be your brother's keeper. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. Spice FM. Nieri. The following takes place from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. every weekday on Spice FM. 
I like listening to you guys. You're the default radio station in my car in the morning. Even the children listen to you guys. <laughs> I agree Parliament has failed this country. And I will say it again. We have not done what we should have done. We know in this country, the Kenya prison sector is one of the most underfunded sector. The way it is being done and the way we're calling it Huduma Number the Musemakweli is because all records will be there. You know, there are people who are now billionaires with uh, no history as to how they got all these uh, <laughs> assets. Well, yes. Anything that the president does that is not in accord with the constitution is an illegal act. You know, he shouldn't be doing it and he should be sitting here and trying to sort of guise it up. I totally believe live transmission of results and allowing Kenyans to be able to view all these results. I believe that it will be impossible to steal elections. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. In the middle of week and where it's a building up this morning, a little bit of it uh, coming out onto the Sika Superhighway, but not too crazy. Um, Mombasa Road also, we're going to see with the completion of those toll stations, a little bit of the diversion this morning, especially coming past the SGR. On Jogo Road this morning, going out into the city is where we have a little bit of traffic here and there, but nothing, again, too crazy. Traffic hasn't really started. But letting you know that we have an eye on things and uh, we need you to help us out as well. If you get sticky where you are going or where you're coming from, let us know and we'll talk. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Text for Zero one two seven. Spice FM Nakuru. This is the Situation Room, the home of hard hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. <laughs> Good morning. You know, Erica set me up this morning. In fact, I'm just going to come and out you once and for all. Good morning. It is 8 past 6 o'clock on the 6th of April, 2022. Oh, sorry. We're we still in March. <laughs> the man has refused to talk. Oh. People from my yard, I beg, make you help me because I don't lose. I not see him again. Eric, good morning. Ninini maswali mingi asubuhi. I was confused. <laughs> so I start speaking in foreign languages. I don't lose. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what totally. I suppose talk again. You don't lose. I don't lose. Finish. How now? Uh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Good morning. Yes. Did you use the expressway? I did not. Everybody's talking, everybody's shouting, Expressway, 9th April is open, blah, blah. How do we get, what are they called, season tickets? Oh, no, it's not a baseball uh, game. How do we get tickets? How much are we supposed to spend? Uh, is this, that, what, 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 Express? Ha, ha. Uh, Wait now. <laughs> <laughs> Wait. Uh, chill. Take it easy. What's wrong? This thing will be open before City comes back. <laughs> okay. And I then? think they know City is away. <laughs> no, he comes back. At this thing, June. <laughs> he last year, June. <laughs> anyway, good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Welcome to Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. It's a lovely day today. Um, it's a good day to actually talk about the SGR. So there's all these conversations that are taking place. They've released how you're going to use SGR. That's we'll talk about it. Okay. And uh, we'll talk about several other things. Today is Wednesday, 
It's the sixth day of March, two thousand and twenty-two. Uh, uh. Yeah. Okay, okay, it's true. Until all those other things finish, we can't say yeah. it's April yet. April it's... is when power bills are going to be low. Okay, so until then, we are in March. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Work, work with the president here. <laughs> work with the president. It's a day to the day when Okur Yatani, the cabinet secretary for the National Treasury, will be in parliament, in the joint session of parliament tomorrow, to talk about the next budget. 3.31 trillion shillings is what the government wants to spend for the next 12 months from June, mm -hmm. uh, from July this year. So what is it that they want to do? How do they want to raise that money? That's what Okur Yatani will be telling us uh, tomorrow in parliament. We'll start those conversations today. We'll be talking about this today, tomorrow, and Friday. Mm. So today, uh, economics professor XN Iraqi. Someone was asking me, so how do you pronounce this XN? Is it Shen? Shen? Is it like Chinese? Shen Iraqi? XN Iraqi will be joining us at 7 o'clock. We'll be looking at... Uh, what is it that um, the government wants to spend this money on, okay? Hmm. Um, and, and he'll be here with us in the studio to talk about all that. And then at 8 o'clock, we'll have two people joining us in the studio and they're running a campaign called Tugutuke. And they'll tell us all about it. One of them is David Kabeberi. David Kabeberi um, is somebody who has been in the round the block for a number of years. Hmm. He is one of the senior... Uh, finance accounts and auditing persons in the country uh, but also he's been very 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 active in matters of governance since the 90s uh, coming into the new century up to date and he's saying uh, he and others have come together and have said to Gutuke we have to be active as citizens mm. so we'll be talking about that as well yes yes plus many other things that we'll be talking about including covid Indeed. Let's look at the numbers in the country at the moment. 11 new cases from a sample size of 3,922. It drops one percentage point to 0.3%. Mm. In terms of positivity rate, zero uh, is what we're still looking at in terms of death. So good numbers. Not so good numbers in terms of vaccinations. Folks are not going out and getting vaccinated. Mm. Uh, still, again, it would appear so the general belief is that COVID is done and dusted and out the window. No, folks, if you can get out and get vaccinated, please do so. Four, almost four million new cases around the globe yesterday. We're now at 494 million, 142,283 COVID cases around the world. Uh, there's a story that's coming out of China. China lockdowns, the economic cost of a zero COVID policy is what the BBC calls it. War, inflation, and now COVID lockdown deja vu in China. It is a perfect storm for the global supply chain. How goods and materials get from other countries to you and me. When disruptions take place, in China, it is significant because about a third of the world's entire manufacturing capacity is based in China. If you're buying something online, there's a very good chance it was made in Shenzhen, a city of about 17.5 million in the southeast, where roughly half of all China's online exporters are based. Mm -hmm. So when Shenzhen went into a six-day lockdown Sunday after a massive surge in COVID cases, it sent shockwaves through the world's businesses. The restrictions have widened to other major cities in provinces like Shanghai, Jilin and Wangzhou. Factories have to suspend production and cities turned into ghost towns. The number of ships waiting at some Chinese ports already increased, according to uh, the monitoring of freight around the world. They saw a 28.5% increase in the number of vessels waiting outside the port of Yantian, which is a major export port to Europe and North America. Mm -hmm. The new measures come at a time when manufacturing output from China was just starting to recover after the Chinese Lunar New Year holidays in February. While China's COVID measures are drastic, however, at least most lockdowns didn't last too long. So you can imagine six days, six days, and the world was feeling the shivers and saying, look, how are we going to continue with our supply chain, mm -hmm. etc." Uh, but China says, in as much as we, we see this, we understand that there's going to be loss. But you know what? We are still going to protect you know, our people. I go back to what City was asking. What exactly is China doing? Mm. Because, okay, so... Yeah, few mild 
and in fact a majority of those cases that they had tested that had tested positive were uh, asymptomatic. asymptomatic cases yes. so why use a sledgehammer on that particular one and then look at what's happening globally mm. look at what how how that is affecting the global supplies global supply chain what's that doing to cost of goods was that a bigger game well i think this is clear look we're talking about how many ships just queuing at the docks in six days a 28.5 percent increase that's ridiculous there you go and what does that mean that <laughs> means that because if those ships are not in the high seas they're not delivering goods it no. means that there's a delay there's a backlog in deli- in the supply of goods what does that mean it increases the cost the cost but they look at what it does on a, on a look at what it does uh, if you look at it uh, subjectively mm. is that it cements china's position in terms of power and capitalism that now you say well you know what i'm going to shut down one two three cities production is going to go to zero essentially and the rest of the world is basically begging us to open because they depend on us so what does it do it cements your position as the person who is supplying a third of the world's import goods export goods come on if anybody was thinking or even <laughs> contemplating anything to do with sanctions how think again it's not going to work man just showing you some of the tools at our disposal without even having a conversation you know some of the tools at our disposal yeah, i don't include. touch you i sh- i yeah. touch myself yeah. like you're affected yeah. my goodness <laughs> <laughs> i think there's a bigger game afoot here it's not about covid it's not about covid nah nah it is 17 minutes after 6 we are live streaming the show as we always do on youtube and facebook spice fm ke and www.spicefm.co.ke if you're online and i can see very many of you are Say hello and we'll be doing the roll call shortly. Our friend George Taita in Germany, are you awake? If you are, so you say hello as well. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The group of leaders we are having now, these are just like the polymers. The chemical composition is the same. Are you corruptible? Hopefully not. <laughs> and, and maybe that's part of the problem. People who have done about 300 speeches and they are not saying anything. What makes you think that they will come in with something really dramatic? Don't miss out on the latest from Kenya's biggest conversation. SMS TSR to 22840. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and Mostly nostalgic ballads. We'll see highs of 26 today. It's also 16 and cloudy in Nakuru. 29 will be the high and lows of 14. Uh, Mostly cloudy conditions at 13 in Nyeri. Highs of 26 and lows of 13. While at 15, Eldoret is cloudy. It'll go to highs of 26 and lows of 14. It's mostly cloudy in Mombasa at 26. We'll see highs of 33. And we'll see highs of 33 in Malindi as well. It's mostly clear for the moment at 28. Kisumu is mostly cloudy at 21. We'll We'll see highs of 31 and lows of 20 today while in Kakamega it's cloudy at 17 highs of 32 and lows of 16 out in Kampala it's 21 degrees we'll see highs of 29 and lows of 19 while cloudy conditions rule Dar es Salaam skies at 25 we'll see highs of 30 17 degrees slightly warmer in Johannesburg today 23 will be the high and lows of 14 while it's mostly clear in Lagos at 28 highs of 34 and lows of 28 Kinshasa is clear at 22 going to highs of 34. Going into afternoon it's 11 degrees in Beijing and sunny, highs of 14 and lows of 2 while 8 degrees and mostly cloudy in Paris. It'll go to highs of 14. We'll see highs of 13 in London where it's partly cloudy at 10 and it's raining Tuesday night in New York, going to highs of 13 and lows of 8. Spice FM. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 uh, uh, Spice uh, FM, everybody. Nairobi. Zuki says, good morning. Did I miss something in the news cycle? Were the SGR contracts made public? Well, <laughs> that's not going to happen anytime soon, so you don't want to hold your They're breath. They're public. <laughs> uh, They're public in somebody's privacy. Yes. So, you know, it's public. 
Susan Harina Nundu says, good morning from Kasarani Mwiki uh, specifically. Good morning, Amos. Um, he's tuned in from Kimi Lili this morning. Omoriki tuned in from Nairobi's Eastlands. He says, I love you, team. Waiting for today's proverb. proverb. Yesterday's was... Yesterday's was wow. Oh, Thank you for reminding me. Wow. Okay, indeed. <laughs> Jose J says, good morning, people. Good morning from uh, Tongareni. Where is that? Tongaren. Hmm. Tongaren is in, which county is Tongaren? Ah, well. Okay, let's not divert your yeah. attention from. Mm, it's, it's, <laughs> in Tong, it's Tongaren. Okay, so. <laughs> 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 from Nyali Mombasa, that's where James Kimanzi is. Buddha Wamai says, good morning from El Bergen. Loud and clear, that's where Vincent is saying he can hear us from. He can hear us from loud and clear. Okay. Maureen Jolla tuned in from somewhere in Kenya. This is a good place to be. Good morning to you all, Shadrach. We see you. Chenonge is Esau. Hey, Esau. Wangige is tuned in this morning. And uh, Mashari says, let's go. Indeed, let's do it. Danny, Nikiwa, Alego, Karapusia County. That's where Victor Marciaya is. And Onesimus Kurgat is tuned in from Nakuru. We see you all this morning. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Karibu sana, everybody. We are still in Malawi with the Proverbs. These Malawians have done a thing on you. Ah, way. <laughs> you don't know. <laughs> When you're crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles. But don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. When you are crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles. But don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. Hmm. <laughs> what are those tiny fish called again? Chihuahuas. <laughs> 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 oh my god. <laughs> Which is what are we talking about? Omena. <laughs> Even worse. Huh? You should have stuck to Chihuahua. <laughs> no, the little carnivorous fish. The little what are they called? Oh, I had the name on my just just now. Poof. It's gone. I'll tell you. Yeah, I, I was thinking about it just now. In fact I had when I was saying Chihuahua. <laughs> Chihuahua, is that what you were thinking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to find it in a minute. Uh -huh. What about <laughs> it? So you translate the proverb. So you can think about that there's the big crocodile and that's what's going to snap you up literally. But there's the little ones who are just as dangerous swimming around. So you might have your eye on this big thing that you worry about. But there are little things along Mind the way. Mind the little ones as well. Yeah. Mm. I like that, actually. Be cautious at all times. Uh. Mm. Trying to think of all the little fish. Eh? I am. It's really doing a thing on me. Ones with teeth. Piranha. Piranha. Thank yes. you. <laughs> Chihuahua. I can see the <laughs> connection. <laughs> uh, okay. Mm. Let's look at the newspaper headlines. Uh, remember www.standardmedia.co.ke. Go in there and get some content that's not even on the paper. This one is exclusive mm. to Watu wa, wa, uh, wa e paper. The story that's there, premium content, the priest who could not resist a beautiful girl, his eyes fell on her and it was bye-bye to celibacy. Okay. Yeah? I want to read that story. Yeah, Cindy, oh. mm -hmm. The priest who could not resist a beautiful girl, his eyes fell on her and it was goodbye to celibacy. <laughs> mm. Yes. Jezebel. Yes. <coughs> and you're now asking about it, Tongaren. Where is Kaptarakwa? Maybe their neighbors. Molimut Dominic Cheriot is telling you where it is. Oh. EMC. What's that? It's a county. It's a county. EMC. C is for county. El Geo Maracuiz. Well done. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, what's in the papers? Well, many things. Of course, it is budget day tomorrow, uh, and uh, everybody's touting about how Kuriatani has a tough task ahead. Let's look at, however, what governors are saying. And they're saying 148 billion shillings, release this to us. Same National Treasury is being asked to do this. The Council of Governors has demanded the immediate release of 148.4 billion shillings owed to the counties by the National Treasury. They said if this does not happen, operations in the devolved units would be paralyzed. They said this two weeks ago. 
They said this two weeks ago. They had said the same thing. I think we even can quote v- v- verbatim that they said this exact same thing, right? Mm. Whereas the total equitable share of revenue stands at 370 billion, only 222 billion has been disbursed to the counties, with only two months remaining to the close of the 2021 2022 financial year. This essentially means that county staff across the country have not been paid um, the month of March, right? Uh. And uh, February, and then part of January. Uh. <clears throat> Excuse me. Of the outstanding amount, twenty six. Uh, sorry, eight point two six billion is owed to eleven counties for January, and another sixteen two uh, billion to twenty two counties uh, for February. Sorry, twenty three. All the counties are owed twenty nine point six billion for March, and another thirty three point three billion for April. This was revealed during a press briefing at the council's headquarters in Nairobi yesterday, where Kisi Governor and Council Vice Chairman James Ongwai said they would engage the central bank, commission and revenue allocation, controller of budget and treasury to provide for an overdraft facility to cushion the counties from the delay in disbursement of funds. The question is, is there a delay in the disbursement of funds or is this just are there just no funds to have this done? <sighs> We call upon the National Treasury to expedite the release of these funds to county governments within, without no further delay. The council shall seek legal redress to resolve the current delay if in disbursements of funds to counties. It comes as the Deputy President William Ruto led Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council, IBEC, tasked the Treasury and Attorney General to work out a mechanism to pay $107 billion of pending bills that were flagged as ineligible pay uh, by the AG. Dr. Ruto said only 45.5 billion of the submitted 153 billion of pending bills had been deemed payable after auditing. The IBEC also asked counties to, together with the Ministry of Devolution and its land counterpart, to ensure that they complete the valuation of assets in the counties and submit their individual reports by late June or early July. But right now, counties are saying, "Look, man, we can't operate, so we've we've exhausted." all other uh, avenues. Uh. So now you, Treasury, you, Controller of Budget, you, uh, Revenue Allocation people, you seek an overdraft from wherever you will seek it and give this money to us. You know, because we cannot continue like this. at some point, we, we will have to have this conversation like on a serious note. Mm. The government is broke. Okay? So it's cash broke. And, and, so we have issues with uh, money being disbursed to counties. We have issues with money being reimbursed to all marketers. We have issues with... There are very many things that are just up in the air. We yeah. have issues with contractors who have started a project and they're not, they're not getting the next tranche of money as they're supposed to. We have so many issues. And when it comes to counties especially, because they are many and they are an executive function... Mm. That's a serious effect. It is. And it's year on year. Every year you will hear counties just basically getting delayed uh, disbursements. It's becoming month on month. Some of them will be getting their disbursement for January in June. When they're out, almost out the door. And, and, and I don't know why. I mean, it just becomes like, you know, one of those things that the yeah, Council of Governors will call a meeting, they'll run... They'll go for a meet for meetings then in we're going uh, the to treasury. They, you know, it's like a negotiation. Let's come to the national treasury and negotiate how the money can be released to us. There's serious mismanagement of our, the purse of the national treasury. But then it almost seems as though the counties are coming out. Well, not almost. They're coming out with a begging bowl for something which it's, is not. Is a right. Is a right. It is not a favor that's being done to them by the national treasury. They're supposed to have this money. So the question, and then not look, I, I watch like clockwork. Come August, co- no, look, okay. come September, October, that annual report is going to come out to tell us how counties did not absolve their yep. funds properly. Yep. How were they supposed Poor to do Poor absorption it? rates. Poor blah, absorption blah, rate by blah. counties. How are we supposed to do that? Fiscal year coming to an end is when now you're going to give them all their money at once, boom, and then say, go. How do you expect them to do it? The year before last, there was that World Bank bump that came in that mm. allowed then the country to complete its budget. Some of that money went to counties. We had Mutula Kilonzo here as Senate went, as they oversighted this and they said, you know what? How do you expect these people to finish the work that they're doing? Yeah. You open the system, you release all this money, then you close then the you system. Then you close the system. How do you expect them 
to now finish these projects. The report that we will see from you six months down the line is that projects in counties were not completed. How do you expect them to complete? I just, I, I don't get it. I just do not understand this thing. I, I don't, you know, there's also an effect to this. Because as long as counties are not receiving, they don't have the money that they need to operate. They need to pay salaries. They're going for overdraft facilities. Overdraft facility means it comes with interest. Yes, yes. So the money that you're going to end up spending, you're basically just taking money and paying interest for overdrafts. What is this? It's a mess. That's what it is. It's a And you cannot tell me that it's people who don't know government. The people who are running counties today, if you just think about them, just think about their experience in government. Okay? Kememia, Nyandaro, a governor, has been head of public service, mm. understands government, mm. right? Mm. Okuria Tani, the head of the National Treasury, has been has a governor. Has been a governor. If you think about uh, the Kakamega governor, Oparanya, has been minister for planning at the National Treasury. All these people have experience in government. Anyang Nyongo has been a planning minister. Minister. What are we talking about? Oh. Aye, it's the, a hot there's, mess. There's a serious issue here that I just, I just don't get. Anyway, I won't get it. You won't? So you're going to forget about no, it? I'm just not caught. I'm, I'm not cut out for it. It's 29 to 7. This is Kenya's biggest conversation. Let's take this quick break, take a look at the traffic, and then we'll look at more newspaper headlines. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The Board of Governors, principal and the entire staff of PC Kenyanjui Technical Training Institute wish to invite all graduates who qualify for the award of Artisan Craft and Diploma Certificate during 2018 to 2021 academic years to the Institute's sixth graduation ceremony. The ceremony will be held on Friday, 8th April 2022 from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Institute's grounds. The chief guest will be Dr. Margaret W. Mwakima, Principal Secretary, State Department of Vocational and Technical Training, Ministry of Education. For more information on PC Kenyanjui, Kenyanjui Technical Training Institute, visit www.kenyanjuitechnical.ac.ke. PC Kenyanjui Technical Training Institute, excellence in technology. Spice FM, Malindi. The, the bypass is looking pretty good. Southern bypass free and clear all the way out towards the city. Uh, it's building up on Mombasa Road today around, around Imaradaima. Uh, but apart from that, traffic doesn't look too bad. A little bit spilling over towards uh, North Airport Road and then out onto Outer Ring. Jogo Road also some traffic here and there. And we're also seeing it going towards Kamkunji this morning. Apart from that, really hasn't started um, in those areas. We're looking at some action building up slowly on the Thika Superhighway. And then you're getting to the Pangani underpass out into the city. That's where you see the most action. But apart from that, if you haven't left, you're still in good stead. Here's an opportunity for you to be out and where you're going in good time. Probably traffic hour will start in about half hour or so, and we'll have a look at that as it builds up. Let's talk on Spice FM, KE on Twitter, text 40127. Welcome to Spice FM, the best exclusive radio station bringing you the best mix of the best music ever. It is uh, 26 minutes to 7 more newspaper headlines. So, Nairobi Expressway, okay? <laughs> uh, it's complete, by the way. All right, so let's just be fair. This thing is done. It's just that we're not driving on it. Now, the company that will be running this expressway is called Moja Expressway Company. Okay. Of course, it's a subsidiary of China Road Bridge, blah, 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 <laughs> airports and ports and everything else. Corporation. Uh, it will run the road for the next 27 years before it hands it over to... The what? Yeah, say that again. 27... You just said 27 years. Say that again. My daughter will be my current age <laughs> by the time these guys are done. Whoa! <laughs> hey! Guy. 
Uh-huh. All her adult life. They'll be paying the express fee. Hey. All her adult life, Moja Express. Moja Express will be, will be like there. Hey. On my daddy. Where? Yep. So Moja Express says motorists could pay via cash at the toll booths or tap and go using a manual toll card. Okay. The farm also says it's offering motorists an electronic toll collection service where they'll be issued with cards that would offer fast and easy transit through the expressway. Unaskia, there are three options. Mm-hmm. One, electronic toll collection mm-hmm. where you just go you have your Did lane. It? Yeah, you you have your lane you like express. coming out of the airport. Yeah. That thing. Yeah. You have express. In fact, the one for the airport is even different because you have that card. You still you have, have the card yeah, you must so have. So this one yeah. just it just ndu, ah ndu. Wacha huyo ni mheshimiwa. Chapite. Or you have the cash or Mpesa toll booths. They say the ETC is the best way because it offers users non-stop passage at the toll gates. Mm-hmm. The manual toll card can be periodically topped up through electronic payments, including mobile money as well as cash payments at the toll gates. Uh, the ETC service provided by Moja allows toll points to be electronically deducted through the pre-installed onboard unit device mm-hmm. that they are calling BUD, right? Offering a non-stop road service. It explains that together ETC card motorists will need to pay a service charge of a thousand bomb they'll okay. also be required to produce their id cards as well as the vehicle's logbook as proof of ownership motorists would also need to buy toll points of at least 2000 shillings which will be deducted whenever they use the road but they are only valid for one year okay the so thousand shilling it, service charge is it recurrent or it's once? i see that is for the card advice <laughs> You keep paying the thousand. Uh, no, no, no. That one you pay once. Okay, so yeah, uh-huh. the, the service charge one thousand. I think it's a I, everything is a, is annual. Okay. Okay, I think we will need to to get that clarification. Service charge one thousand bob. Okay, mm-hmm. and then you pay two thousand shillings, mm-hmm. which will be deducted every time you use the road. Okay. Oh, from the two thousand bob. From the two thousand bob. Okay. Every time you're just using the road, it's, so it's automatically deducted. It's prepaid. Got it. It's like tokens. Mm-hmm. However. Easy Camille Safari come no expiry. This one has expiry. You must use them within the a year. Yes. After the year, mm. the 2000 bob Fisha. top up again. Got it. Moja Expressway is an affiliate of China Road and Bridge Corporation, which I'm calling China Road Bridge. What else have they done in this country? Airport, Airport something. Uh, what else have they done? Buildings, yeah. apartments, those ones or everything the farm that has built the road under public private partnership the expressway operator and kenya national highways authority are expected to start guided trials of the road and the systems that have been installed including automated toll gates the operator will collect the to- road tolls which will be used for maintenance and repair of the double decker road but will also enable crbc to recoup its investment the farm says it has spent 88 billion shillings in building this expressway But Kenyans have raised issues with some of the requirements for purchasing the toll card including the original logbook. What is that though? Some cars are bought on loan and logbooks are held by the banks. So what am I supposed to do? Kuja na bank. Patia bank simu. You can't use your ID. Patia bank ID is for you. Logbook is for the car. You <laughs> together come. You may give you a ball, uh, device. Logbook. Yeah. You logbook come, ID come. The plus two device <laughs> is ready to pair. <laughs> I have an issue as well with that. I mean, wh- what's the issue with logbooks? What yeah. is it? There are those that um have that logbooks on loan, others mm. you you have been so you work for a company. You've been sent go and do this for us mm. because we'll be using this road often. So just go. Oh you oh, you you operating a, co- a company vehicle yes. for example. What's it? I mean, if I'm paying you that I'll be using the road. What business See, it's using what, the road. What business do you have with my vehicle? A to proof of ownership. Why? I'm using the road. Why do I need I'm to not prove that? I'm not asking you for anything. I'm not, I'm not selling you the car. You, <laughs> I want to pay you to use the road. Yes. Now you want to see my vehicle so that I'm not selling you the car. Neither I'm asking you to give me money. I'm not asking you for a loan for this vehicle. I don't understand. I also don't get it. But they say that you need to have the original logbook for you them to give you that thing that is a thousand bob. That gadget. That gadget that they fix on the windshield. 
God. Okay. And where do you go? Nairobi. You have to come here. here There's an office, office here. at on Mombasa Road. So you come there. If you don't want to do that, you'll just be queuing with everybody else at the toll toll booths. Or you use the free road. Or Kauko Cheni. Oh my wait. The next couple of days. Cheni. This Ninth road. April is three days away. Mm. When oh. they start the trials. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wait and hear it. I want to do it though. I'm, you do? I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to do all these things just to see. So I'll be talking from a position of knowledge, of knowledge. and a proper angst. Not hype. Hypothesis. Proper angst. Okay. When I'm here telling you this thing. <laughs> <laughs> you were there. Uh, yes. Yes, that's a good idea, actually. Uh -huh. Sasa. Uh -huh. Matiang. Matiang. Mm? The interior, pra Prime Minister. <laughs> the Interior Cabinet Secretary, Fred Matiangi, has claimed that the attack on Azimio La Umoja won Kenya. That's another mouthful. With your Kenya, China roads. Yep. Presidential aspirant Rilo Odinga's helicopter in Wasingishu County last week was planned. The CS, while appearing before the Administration and National Security Committee of the National Assembly yesterday, wait, can I, before I continue with this story, isn't it very interesting right. that the insecurity that we have been seeing in Kerio Valley, hmm? mm. how long did it take after the summoning of the same CS to appear before the same committee? Mm. How long did it take for him to appear and tell us what was going on? Yeah. Anyway, moving along swiftly. Uh -huh. There is food for thought. The CS, while appearing before said committee, uh, said the stoning of Mr. Odinga's chopper was an isolated incident, but mentioned three similar incidents around the country. He told the committee that the 17 suspects arrested involving Mr. Sorry, in connection with the incident involving Mr. Odinga, had wads of notes in 50 shilling denominations. This, he said, shows that the suspects were gathered and paid to cause the chaos. The police, hot on the heels of the perpetrators, acted swiftly and arrested the suspects with wads of notes, he said. Uh, the attack happened after Mr. Odinga had just left the funeral of his friend and prominent former and prominent former Jackson Kibor. We will go in the direction the investigation will take us, Dr. Matiangi said. The CS also disclosed that the phones of three politicians, Soy MP, Caleb Kostani, Kapseret MP, David Sudi, and Wasingishu County Assembly Speaker David Kiplagat, and those of the 17 suspects were confiscated for analysis to establish if there was a link before the incident. Kostani and Sudi have denied claims that they played a role in the stoning of Mr. Dinga's chopper. The legislators accused the Directorate of Public in of Criminal Investigations, I beg your pardon, in, uh, of engaging in pol a political witch hunt. Okay. The three other incidents Dr. Matiangi mentioned were Deputy William Ruto's uh, encounter with rowdy youth in Kisumu, in Busia and Jacaranda grounds in Nairobi. You know, mm. first, it's really, really unfortunate what happened uh, in Eldorado over the weekend, mm. right? Number one. Number two, yes, that was a dangerous thing for people to do. I mean, go torn. You could even have hit somebody. You know those things that people could have died. Yes, right? things happen. It, that is to be condemned completely. But I told you the other day, Monday, Ndu, this whole hula balloon, it'll die down. Mm. Nobody will be taken to court. There'll be nobody who is basically punished over what happened. There'll be a lot of talk, or oh, we have someone, the MPs, we have someone, oh, the Matiangi has gone to parliament. He has said this thing was planned. We arrested people with words of 50 notes, 50 bob. So, okay, so have you, is there a direct connection between the words of 50? And, and there'll be a lot of talk. It'll die down. And we'll move on. We will move on. Nothing is going to come out of this. All this, what we are seeing now is choreography. Mm. And incidentally, we have not talked about BBI. About what? Yes, you see. <laughs> the conversation shifted from BBI into something else. And it's just been the big issue, this big drama. And then tomorrow we'll go into budget. We have moved on. Misha. He attacked a helicopter. Story. Meanwhile, as we're saying all these things, Children sat KCP and we spoke to some children who were in Elgeo Marakwet County, right? Yes. And those, in, no, 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 in no, West, no, no. West Pocot, West Pocot County. But we know children in West Pocot County, in uh, Baringo, in some parts of Elgeo Marakwet, in some parts of Laikipia, have, and in some parts of Samburu as well, some parts of, um, of Masabit, were sitting this exam 
in heightened insecurity. Now, the Ministry of Education is under pressure to consider special Form 1 selection for candidates from areas affected by insecurity in Baringo County. <clears throat> While the selection is ongoing, lawyer Frida Lotuya has expressed concern over the process and wants learners from the region given special consideration. She has written to the Principal Secretary of the Ministry of Education and called on the government to do a mapping of all the schools that were affected by insecurity in the region. Do a mapping for all the schools that were affected by the insecurity and after such mapping, accord a special consideration to the candidates from the mapped schools when admitting them to Form 1 in various secondary schools. The letter has been received by the Ministry. Schools in Mochongoi, Makutani and Ilchamu's wards were affected by insecurity. This disruption, she said, saw schools closed and at the same time of sitting at the exams, tension was high. The lawyer says, even with the environment not being conducive, some students performed exceptionally well. Mm. And she says it would be unfair and unjust to use uniform admission criteria for all the candidates without taking into consideration the prevailing circumstances during the time of examination. Now, this lawyer, her name again, you want to know? Mm. Her name is Frida Lotuya. Hmm. This is one lawyer who deserves a round of applause because what she's raising is pertinent and it's the truth. You cannot subject them to level playing field knowing that there's a child who was not able to attend school for many days because of insecurity. Absolutely. There's a child who was coming to school, but at the back of her mind or his mind, he's wondering, am I going home? Or, or somebody who was I... ravaged just the night before. Yes. And they sat an exam. And didn't sleep. And they got 200 marks, 176 marks, 300 marks. Fantastic We know people who got, we, we were being told of those kids who got 390 marks. Yeah. Under such circumstances. Yep. Such a child should be considered. And I think it's important. We live and look for this lady. Uh, this is a this is a good, a good conversation. Absolutely Story was done necessary. by Julius Chipkonyi in Nakuru. We'll find him. Absolutely necessary to have done. I mean, we're, we are not. Uh, if we're not looking at the people who are going through these difficult circumstances, but looking at things that honestly really are not important. Imagine. Problem. Problem. It should be a big conversation right now. This is the conversation we should be having. So what do we do with these children? What do we do with the children who are, uh, have um, sat their form for as well? And How do you give them a fair shake at an education? Yeah. With all the things that they're going through, which the same state should make sure that they are in a secured environment. That's not happening. Well, all right then. Give them another opportunity to get on the platform. Yes. Absolutely. Yes, and I'm looking for another story because it's related. I've seen another a similar mm -hmm. story, still a story about education and uh, Form 1 selection. Mm -hmm. This is... Yes, yes, yes. Same page, actually. Page 22 of the standard. So the Parents Association uh, of Kiambu wants the ministry to consider placing top 2021 KCP candidates in local national schools. So here's the story, okay? Mm -hmm. The majority of there are very many national schools in Kembu County, and those traditional big national schools, yeah. many of them are in Kembu County. Mm -hmm. Now, the parents of Kembu are saying uh, at least 30% of slots in national schools should be given to Kembu pupils who scored over 400 marks. So, they keep them at home, yeah. Basically, our local schools, them. our alliances, yeah. And the mangoes should be kept for our children. Yeah, so 10% because it's 30%. Yeah. Because it's here, I mean, let our children at least get 30% of our children get mm. these slots. He says, out of the 3,500 pupils who were placed in national schools nationally in 2020, only 300 were placed in national schools in Kiambu County. So last year, there were 3,500 Kiambu pupils who scored 400 and above. Mm -hmm. 3,500 from Kiambu. Mm. But only 300 got slots in the Kiambu National Schools. Many of them ended up being taken to. It's just 1%. Yeah. And we're asking for 1,000 slots, which is 30% in this year's Form 1 selection in our national schools, instead of 300, which is only 10%. And the rest the government can then take to the other schools. Wanjama said Kiambu has the highest number of national schools and thus deserves a bigger quarter. Some of the national schools in Kiambu include Alliance High School, 
Alliance Girls, Mangu High, Mary Hill Girls, Limuru Girls, Loreto High School, Extra County Schools, Thika Boys High School, Chania Boys, Chania Girls, St. Francis Girls, Kiambu High School. So they're saying, look. Give us a shot here. Yeah. A majority of these schools, and these are the ones that are now have serious competition. Mm. The Alliance, Alliance Girls, Mary Mangu, Hill, Mary yeah. Hill, Limuru Girls, Loreto High School. They're saying, uh, can we get some preferential treatment? Does it make sense? Well, look. <laughs> look. How do you preclude others just because you're the sons and daughters of the county? You know? But now you're saying, all right, so we are here. Give us an opportunity to go to our own schools. I wonder if the conversation would be the same if these schools were not top performing schools. You see, that's the thing. They are top performing schools. And we cannot run away your, from that fact. Of, of course. Uh -huh. They happen to be in your county yes. where you are from, where you reside on yes. this. And our, our pupils, because they know these schools, they have selected these schools. Mm. But because of the con competition, because of quota system, because of everything else, they end up only a hundred of them getting these slots. Mm. And you're saying, uh, no, only 300 of them getting these slots within. And you're saying, nah, we want more. The request makes sense to me, I must be honest. <laughs> Does it? Yeah. Is it not selfish? Of course it is. But it's the same thing. If you have resources in an environment where you have resources, don't we see the same conversation where people are saying, well, look, in as much as this is a national thing, there must be something that's set aside for the local community. Everybody's scrambling for it, right? Uh, Do you give preferential? It's difficult. It's difficult. But I can see the sense in the request. I can see the sense in the request. Would it make sense how you roll it out? Maybe that's something totally different. I can see the sense in the request, but it's a difficult one to make. You know, when it comes to water, let's say Moranga and water, all right? When you say you, you cannot are have taking Moranga care. Look, I get it, I get it. You are taking care of the resource. You are taking care of the trees and the forest that are producing the water. Mm. If it comes to mineral resources, you are taking care of the environment. I get it. Now, what is Kiambu? What are the residents of Kiambu doing to take care of lands? It's just the school. What is the local community? Yes. So yeah. somebody in, uh, in, 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 in the Degwa, what are they doing to take care of Limuru girls? Mm. How are they? I mean, what? Are, yeah, it's, it's, it's in your county, but what are you doing to? Yeah, it's because, it's, it's because you, it is in your county, it's not as of right then that you get preferential treatment as to how your children can attend. Ah. That's what I, I can see. The I can see the sense on the side of those who are making the request. But does it make sense in that? Even when you want to look at the establishment of these schools, was it done just for the area alone or was it not meant to attract students from around the, from the country? From across the country, yes. Yeah. Is this a natural resource? It's, if it's a it's, natural resource, we can have the yeah, conversation. This is not a natural resource. Yes. It's is Mangu High School a natural resource? <laughs> That's, uh, you know. It's free for, it's for yeah. everybody. And actually. it's endemic to it's <laughs> not actually. Kiambu. It's not. It's not. Um, yeah. Uh -huh. Police probe, one of your favorite topics. Police probe parents, FGM ringleaders colluding to cut girls. This is coming out of the counties. Fears of thriving underground female circumcision ring were rife yesterday in central Kenya following the arrest of seven suspects. They are being questioned over reports they subjected eight children to the cut. The girls were rescued by officers from the Mukrueni police station at the weekend. Six others had already undergone the cut in Mudueni village during the night ceremony. Residents said FGM is still orchestrated by the new religious cult known as Guatandai. It operates underground ceremonies supported by parents who want their daughters to be circumcised. The perpetrators took advantage of the two-month school holiday after their ceremonies were disrupted in December by the new school calendar. Residents call for heightened vigilance to stop perpetrators who seem to have learned how to evade the authorities. Kenya outlawed the practice in 2011, but it continued secretly, with many of these undergoing the painful cut being between the ages of nine and 17 police officers monday acted on a tip-off and busted the alleged ringleaders five women and two men were arrested mukruweni sub-county police uh, commander patrick manyasi said the detectives also arrested the owner of the house in which the cutting ceremony was being conducted two women believed to have taken the girls for the cut are currently in police custody Yesterday, a court in Yeri ordered the suspects to be remanded at the Mukureni police station. They're waiting a ruling on a police application that they be held for six days as investigations continue. You know, huh? 
This goes beyond FGM. Uh-huh. Okay. Mm. This is uh, happening in central Kenya. Like you've heard, it's a religious cult known as Gwatadai. Gwatadai Dai is a riddle. Riddle? Yeah. Uh-huh. So when you want to say riddle me this, you say Gwatadai. Okay. Now, there's been conversation in the communities around Mount Kenya region for a long while about these people who are considered traditionalists. Then they're saying, let's go back to the roots. Let's go back to our customs and let's start practicing the customs. And the people who are really, really pushing for the return of FGM are women in the community. Mm -hmm. And there are those who are even excommunicating their mothers and their children and saying, you know what, Uh, you you subjected me through FGM and that was wrong. And you need to, you need to, um, you know, perform some ceremonies in order to cleanse yourself and cleanse me because you violated me. So there's a bigger, a deeper conversation than just going to arrest people and taking them to court and saying that they are perpetrating FGM. Another conversation is to happen. As they say that they're having all these conversations, we know the cultural leaders and they, I don't know, Council of Elders meeting in Mukuru Wanyagadanga and we anointing who to be the president. <laughs> they should be having these conversations in the community because this is a deep issue. If you spoke to people who know what's happening in central Kenya, mm-hmm. with this, it's a big issue. Mm. It's like what was happening just kitchen with Mungiki for a while until it became a national menace. And mm. this, they're running away from it, all of them. All these leaders, they know. Mm. All the governors, they know. All the MPs know what's happening. Not easy to 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 push this one out. Uh, I remember sitting with uh, Lina Jabi Kelimo and she said to me the same thing you're saying. She said, you know what? Even her being a champion to uh, remove the uh, FGM, FGM mm. she said the difficulty in this, people are not trying to be criminals. People have a deep-rooted belief in this tradition. Mm. Now, uh, the fact that it continues underground is a big indicator that uh, people still believe in the tradition. Mm. And I think she's of the same view, whereby it has been, and a lot of people are of the same view, that the conversation needs to be a lot deeper than arrests and throwing people behind yep. bars. Yep. Because will it stop? It will not. It will you not. cut off a head here, another one. And this one in central, it's, it's a return off. Mm. This is a spike that's happening here. And there's a reason why it's happening. It's not just people just woke up one morning and decided, oh, you know, FG. No, there's something else that's happening. There are people who are, who are preaching this. There are people who are going around spreading this message. And because of political um, expediency, there are those who see it as a good thing for people mm. who are rallied around, you know, cultural t- traditions and norms. That conversation should be, hap- should be happening in that form, not arresting people, at three women, two men, take them to court. That will do nothing to alleviate the issue. Anyway, water is a big thing, mm. right? And we know that every time we talk about food shortage, we also talk about water scarcity. And for very many communities, water is a big issue. Now, schools play a very important role in, uh, in a community. Colgate has been supporting uh, schools in uh, drilling wells in uh, the communities in seven counties. And they have benefited very, very many people. And Colgate are saying, this year, 2022, we want to do more, right? Mm. We want to make sure that we support an extra 300, dig an extra 30 wells uh, and and they wanted to support. Indeed, I mean, what it would be able to do for communities mm. when you have children then who don't, you know, the stories that we know of children who've had to walk kilometers every morning to get water for their homes before they go to school kind of thing. Uh, schools then that would have water, families that would have clean drinking water mm. to be able to drink and then cook with and clean with and things like that. It is a life changing experience when you have a water source in close proximity to your home. Yep. When you go to Naivas next time, buy a tub of Colgate and from that you will be helping to add 30 wells 
in the communities. Good morning. Keep it here for more conversations coming up. We look at the budget that Okuri Tan will be presenting to Parliament tomorrow. Yeah. Professor Aksen Iraqi will be with us. Good morning, 7 a.m. Spice up your life. The latest news from around the world, 94.4 Spice FM. This is Newsroom, Dennis Aceto. The budget reading that is scheduled for tomorrow will proceed as planned after National Assembly Speaker Justin Muturi gave the go-ahead. In his communication to the House, Muturi emphasized the need for every allowance to be made to ensure the exercise proceeds smoothly despite the final estimates and the 2022 finance bill having not been submitted to the House. Muturi had earlier stated that he would be reluctant to give the go-ahead for Yatani to read the 3.31 trillion shillings budget unless Parliament approves the Division of Revenue Bill 2022 that shares as revenue with counties and the national government. Meanwhile, the Office of the Auditor General has revealed that counties have accumulated a total of 152.5 billion shillings in pending bills, exceeding 148.39 billion shillings outstanding revenue allocation balance. Auditor General Nancy Gadungu made the revelations during an Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council convened by Deputy President William Ruto at his official residence in Karen. IBEC brings together the Council of Governors, National Treasury and other government agencies mandated to oversee disbursement of allocations and auditing of public expenditures. Now, the influx of illegal farms in areas prone to violence, especially the North Rift Valley region of Baringo and Laikipia, has been linked to the never-ending conflict in the war-torn zones. Appearing before National Assembly Security Committee, Interior Cabinet Secretary Fred Matangi attributed these to political instability in the neighboring countries, which makes it easy for bandits to access weapons. The Interior Boss, however, pointed out that there is need to look into the character of every conflict as they have been propelled by different reasons, including political competition, land conflict or even fight for resources. And voter bribery and mobilization of rented crowds are the main challenges the National Police Service is facing in the build-up to the August 9th general election. The government has now warned that there will be no sacred cows in the crackdown on perpetrators of political violence. This is according to Interior Cabinet Secretary Dr. Fred Matangi, who spoke when he appeared before the National Assembly Departmental Committee on Administration and National Security. With just 125 days to the general election, the security operator in the country is on high alarm over two key election malpractices that might trigger political violence during and after the polls. And Sunnah East Member of Parliament, Junet Mohammed and his Mbakasi East counterpart, Babo Wino, recorded statements at the Directorate of Criminal Investigations over the attack on Raila Odinga. The two legislators arrived at the DCI headquarters where they recounted their recollection of the incident. And Kalenjin elders have apologized to Azmiyo presidential candidate Raila Odinga of an incident in Soi where his helicopter was stoned and destroyed. The elders said such hooliganism is not in the culture of the community and called on authorities to punish the perpetrators who stoned Raila's chopper at Cabenas in Wasangishu as the former prime minister headed to the funeral of tycoon farmer Jackson Kibor. The elders led by the spokesperson of the Kalenjin Council of Elders in Wasangishu, Edwin Chipsiror, visited Kibor's home and the scene where the incident took out. This as Wiper Party leader Kalonzo Musioka says no amount of stoning will hinder their resolve to sell the agenda of the Azimula Umoja One Kenya Alliance Coalition political party in regions where they are perceived to be unpopular. While referring to last week's incident where Odinga was attacked in West Tengeshu County, Musioka expressed optimism that before August 9th, they would have won the votes of the majority of people who do not believe in their cause. He observed that the warm reception they continue to receive across different parts of the country is indicative of the impending victory that will see Odinga sworn in as Kenya's fifth president. Now, government spokesperson Colonel Retired Cyrus Aguna 
has stressed the need to conserve the environment as a way of mitigating the prolonged dry spell experience in parts of the country. Speaking in Olokurto Ward in Narok, North Sub County, while presiding over a relief food distribution exercise, Ogona stated that the ongoing drought in the country is attributed to environmental degradation that is caused by cutting down trees. Ogona noted the conservation of Masai Mau forest was the government's priority as it benefits millions of people in and outside the country. And finally, Newswire continues to ask all Kenyans from everywhere in and outside the country to continue maintaining peace during this political season even as politicians continue campaigning. Remember, your neighbor will remain being your neighbor. This country will exist after the August 9th general election. Therefore, be your brothers and sisters keeper. This is News I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. Spice FM, Nakuru. Traffic on the Sika Superhighway this morning, and we're looking at quite some of it uh, going out into the CBD. It's also building up on Uhuru Highway uh, into town and then out into Westlands. Not looking too bad coming out of Chiromo uh, this morning. Still, folks, not on the road. Uh, still, uh, Jogo Road a little bit here and there. La Lunga Lunga is also building up some outering, looking really good. The Thika Super Highway then just past Survey is where we see some traffic. And then at the junction of Outer Ring, Kiambu Road is also building up. But that's where we'll see the most action this morning coming out of Westlands. Not too bad. This is survivable uh, from what it seems right now. And uh, we'll get into traffic, uh, it looks like, much later into the hour. Let's talk on Spice of MKE on Twitter, text 40127, just in case you get stuck. But from all indications, it doesn't look like that's going to happen this morning. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. Seven this after seven, the good morning. Room. It's the sixth day the of, only way. Uh, shall it be April now? Not yet. Sixth day of March, 2022. <laughs> <laughs> a couple of days, a couple of days. Yeah, to, till the end of March, and then we shall see the announcement from the energy ministry. The cost of power has come down by a further 15%. And President Uhuru Kenyatta will be driving on the expressway. Mm. And that will be the end. That will mark the end of March. Okay. Until then. Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed. We're still in March. We will be talking about the budget shortly. Painful budget is a headline by the standard today. Ukuri Atani, the cabinet secretary for the National Treasury, will be in parliament tomorrow to present the next financial year's budget. And Professor Exxon Iraqi will be with us. But before then, today's proverb, still in Malawi. When you're crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. <laughs> when you're crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. Prof, when you hear that proverb, what comes to mind? Fish. <clears throat> fish. I, I love eating fish. Uh -huh. <laughs> But I think the proverb is about two big issues. Mm. Should you worry about taking risks or not taking risks? Because if I cross the river, I might be bitten by the crocodile. Mm -hmm. But I might end up getting some fish. Mm. And if I get some fish, I'll be very lucky. So I think it's about taking risks. Should you take risks or not? My argument is mm. take some risks in life. They are worthy. Mm. One way. But here we're talking about not you eating fish. But you getting bitten by the little fish? Uh, uh, I don't think uh, the fish never bites anybody. <laughs> I'm these things that Eric calls <laughs> chihuahuas, but are actually <laughs> called piranhas. 
that exist in bodies of water. Uh, are you sure there are piranhas in Marawi? <laughs> <laughs> or in rivers? <laughs> have, have, you had, have you heard of anybody in Kenya being bitten by a, by by a, a fish? fish? <laughs> I don't think so. Um, I probably be, I should probably be more concerned about siafu or mm. and or safari ants than fish. Fish are supposed to be eaten. <laughs> but maybe we should talk to Amarui and ask him why they came up with that problem. Yeah, probably there's something. I'm For sure now we can only have our own interpretation somewhere. which might be mm. right or wrong. Mm. <laughs> Professor Exen Iraki is an economics analyst. He's a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. Good to have you on the show again, Prof. Long time. Uh, you haven't been here this year. I haven't been here. I was here before COVID. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yes, he was before yes. COVID, and then we saw you virtually. Oh. I survived the COVID, <laughs> and I will survive Ukraine, <laughs> and whatever else they bring. And from that, I have a feeling I will live a wrong life. <laughs> that's and, a good. That's a good point to start. I hope you join me. We Indeed. will be there. But I'm worried about the budget. <laughs> the budget. Yes. That's what we're talking about today. The CS will be in Parliament tomorrow. The headline in the Standard today is painful budget. President signs the Division of Revenue Bill, which now uh, outlines how the money is going to be shared between the national and county governments, if at all it's going to be shared. And now that move paves way for the CS to read the budget speech in uh, Parliament tomorrow. Remember the court said, you cannot read budget before you have passed the Division of Revenue Revenue. Bill. Come on, what are you talking about? So now we are in steps. And the first issue is for the president. This is President Kenyatta's last budget, and he needs enough revenue to complete his legacy projects, but he also needs to pay debts and manage the high cost of living. Two counties. National government owes counties 148 billion shillings for the current financial year, leaving them in awkward financial positions even as the next budget is unveiled. For Parliament, MPs seeking re-election will have difficulties approving the budget if it raises the cost of living. Taxes will have to be hidden because the Treasury has to raise 2.1 2.1 billion shillings in taxes. The Treasury, Okuri Atani, has to strike a delicate balance between raising an extra 300 billion shillings and ensuring cost of goods remains manageable in an election year. And finally, for the Kenyans, taxpayers would want lower taxes but more spending on development, not just civil service salaries. They also want the government to spend less on debt. Eh, all those things, all of them sound like just lofty dreams <laughs> for everybody. It seems from from the way you you have read the demands of the budget, mm. seems that budget should be implemented by a magician, not an economist. <laughs> There's so much being demanded by the voters, by the politicians, and the president has to think about the budget, not the budget, but elections in in August. Mm-hmm. And since we are, are near when we are going to the polls, you must not annoy the voters. Mm-hmm. But the circumstances seem to be that you must annoy them in some way because you must fund certain projects. And that money must come from either debt, which you don't, they don't like, or from more taxes, which they don't like. Mm. How do you balance that? I don't envy politicians anymore. Mm. But then, if you think about it, the president does not have um, anything to do with this budget. I mean, in terms of he is not going to be the one to implement these budgets. That's budget, what, the financial year begins in July, the president is out of office by the end of August. So That's what makes the budget more exciting. In fact, w- mm. the, one of the things I'm most interested about the budget mm. when it is read on Thursday, and I will be very keen, is to find out what are some of the policies and dreams of the two presidential contenders are going to be the budget. Mm. Are we going to find bottom-up economics there? Mm-hmm. Are we going to find the 6,000 promised to Kenyans there? Mm-hmm. And I see the budget on last day as a political statement. It will give us a direction on which direction the weed is brewing, the political weed is brewing. So I'm looking forward to it. Mm. But the issue of the debt, yeah. the issue of the cost of living, the issue of subsidies, the issue of what is happening in Ukraine, mm. expect a lot in that budget. I want to see how they are going to be addressed. Can we do, uh, if we're able to see uh, generally, because this trepidation was felt last year. The same thing that we're seeing without these elements that we are discussing today. Subsidies, the war in Ukraine, et cetera, et cetera. High cost of living having maybe doubled. This same fear was felt before the reading of the budget last year. How then has the performance been in terms of keeping the lines tight between last year 
when we had what was it? Uh, what was the amount on the budget last 3. year? Three point six. Three point six trillion shillings, mm. and then performance to date in this fiscal year. How would you say the performance has been year on year between 2021 and 2022? Let's give credit where it is due. Mm -hmm. I think between last year and now, the economy has recovered. I think last year the economic growth was almost zero. This year we expected to hit about six, 5 to 6 percent, mm. riding on post-COVID recovery. Kenyans recent and went for mass vaccination. <clears throat> we, got a, we got a vaccine for COVID-19. And that gave us an impression the economy is recovering, mm. that things are going back to normal. And that is why the inflation has gone up, because people are demanding goods and services. And when this, the demand for goods and services goes up, inflation goes up. So I think for, for all intention and purposes, we have done better than expected. The problem is <clears throat> that not much has changed in the last one year. Mm. Mm -hmm. We haven't got excess revenue to cover the cost of paying salaries, the cost of paying debts. We, we haven't recovered ma that much. So that's why things are almost the same compared last year, as, uh, uh, if you compare last year and this year. Mm -hmm. And that is the dilemma of the finance minister and the president and other policy makers. How do we move from where we are? Ukraine was not there, it is there. Yep. So mm -hmm. we are recovering from COVID-19, another crisis comes. So it needs a lot of political brinkmanship, a lot of economic analysis. But that's why we voted these gentle ladies and gentlemen to lead us in times of crisis, not just when things are good. Yeah. You mentioned that uh, it would require the stuff of Houdini and other magicians to be able to have... But not, not Vundu. <laughs> 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 to have this done in terms of seeing a budget that with all these demands. Why do you say that, Prof? If you look at uh, the current political situation in this country, economic situation in the country. We have two sides of the budget. We have the revenue mm. and we have the cost. The revenue has not gone up substantially the last one year. Mm. Why? Because you need to deepen the tax that Kenyans get. I know Ken KRA has done quite well in leading more, leading more taxes, mm. but not substantially. So if you want things to change as compared with last year, then you must raise more taxes. You must get more money from debt or from donors. That has not happened. But the demands have gone up because people are saying we want the cost of living to go down. Mm -hmm. And one interesting way of bringing the costs of living down, which, is, which I don't support, mm -hmm. is giving people subsidies. Mm -hmm. The oil marketers are demanding subsidies. The fertilizer farmers are demanding, uh, de de demanding subsidies. So the revenue side has not gone up, but the demand side has gone up. And that's why I'm saying you need a magician. Mm. Because where are we going to get money to fund all these demands? The counties are demanding their money. So it, it needs a lot of balancing act. And that's why somebody was very right to say that you might have to hide some, some things. Mm. Take from this hard, take from that hard. And I'm really, really looking forward to seeing that budget on that day to see how that balancing is coming out. Prof, you said that we have performed well. And that, this was in response to Undu's question of, how the 3.6 trillion shillings was spent has been spent in this current financial year when you say it has we have performed well what exactly are you talking about not looking at okay so there's been economic growth but has money gone into the proper allocation has this 3.6 trillion shillings been spent properly I think that's that's a very good question, particular, particularly when you ask that question very in the morning hmm. <laughs> in the middle of, uh, at, the, at the start of the month. Hmm. When I say that the economy is doing well, is a is a, is a broader question. I'm looking at it f with from the from the top mm. as a bird's point, bird's eye. Mm. That as an economist, I see the economy has done well because GDP has improved. Mm -hmm. But I think you are right in asking: Has that money flowed to to our pockets? Am I feeling that my pocket has more money? Mm. Because that's the ultimate test of Wanjiko and people on the streets. So by saying that the economy has done very well, it does not mean that everybody has done very well. In fact, when you talk to the people on the streets, they will tell you there's no money. Mm. And that's not surprising because you remember we are recovering from, we are recovering from posts from COVID. Yes. And a lot of businesses had collapsed. A lot of people had lost their jobs. Mm -hmm. So we are, I'm simply saying we are doing well because we are doing very badly. <laughs> if you had no money in your pocket and you get one sharing, it's significant. Yeah, <laughs> so a that, big improvement. Yes, that's my argument. It's not that we have done as well as expected. Mm. No, we are not done as well as expected. It's not that we are coming from a hole. 
So when we start seeing the right out of the hole, we seem to have done well. What, is, what are the contributory factors to this poor performance? Because I remember a time where you say, okay, well, you've not done well, right? Even if it was in school and you get your report card and you say, okay, a couple of C's here, some D's, you could do better, maybe one B. But one of the fundamental things that they looked at then was what caused this bad performance and then what can we do to improve so that come around the next grading cycle and we see another report card, perhaps we can have a, some more B's there and a few more A's and a few A's. So what would you say then are the indicators of this poor performance that then ought to be looked at to then do better? You give me an impression that you must have been a very good student. <laughs> And uh, next time I come to this studio, I'll be mad I see your report form. <laughs> <laughs> Remember, I'm a teacher. So <laughs> I'd like to see that report form. That might give me an impression why you're either very good in this studio or very mm. bad in this studio. Mm. But that apart, I think one of the contributing factors why we have not done as good as expected, they are both internal and external factors. Mm. One of the internal factors uh, is that uh, nobody wants to, to say it, but it's a fact that we have not handled the problem of corruption very well. Mm. So a lot of money has been getting lost, as we see in the headlines. Corruption has not been tamed. And that means that people who work hard every day in this country are discouraged. So mm. they are not as productive as expected. Because if corruption was tamed and people work mm -hmm. and go beyond the core of duty, mm -hmm. then we'd have people being more productive. We'd mm -hmm. have more revenue being generated and mm -hmm. taxes would go up. That's one way to look at it. Mm. Number two, I think we, need, we have not improved the working environment as much as expected. Now, when we think about the working environment or the, the, the so-called uh, economic environment, th think of things like highways. Highways have improved substantially. Mm -hmm. But productivity is not, you know, is not just about highways. We mm -hmm. need to improve the working relationship. For example, the regulations. Mm -hmm. People complain that our, sometimes our regulations are not very friendly to business. Mm -hmm. A very good example is you go talk to a businessman, he'll tell you that I have 10 licenses to, to look at. Mm -hmm. Why can't we have one license? Why can't we have? Why can't we make it as easy as possible to do business? So that those are the two internal issues that mm -hmm. I see are stopping us from doing as well as expected. And of course, the third one, which might surprise you, is that Kenyans are becoming very pessimistic. Uh. <laughs> Every place you look around is something bad, something that is annoying. And optimism is very important in economic growth. So we need more good news so that our children don't see negative headlines every day. And of course, we have the external environment, mm. which we cannot, we, which we have no control over. Mm. The war in Ukraine interrupted supply chains, and at the same time, raised the price of oil. Oil is very important in ingredient in economic productivity, transport, logistics, uh, the generation of power, and so on. So, if you combine those internal things and external things, mm. you can see the poor performance. War in Ukraine is just it's a, it's a re very recent thing. I mean, the effect of the war in Ukraine has been felt in March. But, but we're talking about a financial year that began in July. But remember, remember that before war in Ukraine came, we had COVID. So COVID, war in Ukraine came to make us a bad situation worse. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm saying the internal factors and external factors. Both have combined to make us feel that life is not very good economically. Mm. Then they, there is an issue that you mentioned, which you said you are vehemently opposed to the issue of subsidies. Why so? Now, this, uh, I'll give you my economic answer. Mm. Because when you give people subsidies, you are telling them that you don't need to work very hard. And subsidies are a very simple concept. I don't know whether you remember a very famous musician called uh, Tracy Chapman. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, some of you look as if your most, po most popular musician is Tupac Shakur. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's, that's for another day. And uh, I, rem I remember... Trust the chairman singing a song. I don't know whether you want me to sing for you. Mm -hmm. Just give, sing it. Give me subsidy. Mm. Life is hard. Subsidies are usually given to people who are the lower echelons of the society. Mm. People who cannot make heads meet. That can be in terms of food or in terms of housing. But here we are giving subsidies to people who, are, who can make heads meet. Mm. For example, the oil market are not poor people. So I'm giving them subsidies. And subsidies also distort the economics. For example, if oil is costing 150 shillings and we are buying it at 130 shillings, we pay the oil marketers 20, 20 shillings as a subsidy because they are selling at a cost. Mm. Good economics because you might argue that the economy will do well because the price of oil is down. Mm -hmm. But somebody is paying that, that subsidy 
Yep. And that is me and you. Mm-hmm. Yep. And that is why I'm against subsidies because some people benefit others rules. Mm. So my argument has always don't use subsidies. Let the, the market give us prices. But who, isn't there a different uh, argument though? And who told you that uh, the price of oil would be higher if we did not have subsidies? They probably would be lower. Are we misapplying the term subsidy when it comes to this petroleum one? Because uh, this is not a subsidy. This is, it's a levy that has been collected and then it's being used to stabilize the market in terms of pricing. But uh, whether you look at it that way or not, mm. it is still a subsidy because those gentlemen are getting more money than expected. Remember that if the market was, if the price was not, was not controlled, we'd probably be buying petrol at something like 150. So that money would be get, coming directly from us, not from the government. Mm-hmm. So it is still a subsidy. Personally, I'm not a supporter of subsidies. The fertilizer subsidy. And then they tell you to buy only 20 bags. So how is it, how is it helping farmers? Okay. And by the way, instead of having subsidies for fertilizer mm-hmm. and having subsidies for petrol, why don't we let anybody who can import oil import it? Why don't we let anybody who can import fertilizer import it? And then we are going to have an oversupply of fertilizer, an oversupply of oil, and the prices will go down. Are we Why should we liberalize that? an economy that years ago? Then we are still talking about price controls. Let the market do its work. Is that not what the market has been doing when it comes to fertilizer? Then why we have it's a free market, yes. but now because of all these things that you've talked about, COVID, supply chain, uh, disruptions because of the Ukraine war, the kind of inputs that uh, go into making fertilizer coming from Russia and Ukraine, that affects the market for fertilizer. But, but that is a short-term solution. Mm. Because uh, can you imagine going to buy fertilizer? You need uh, a thousand bags of fertilizers. You mm. are told you must or can only buy 20. It, it's, it's not, that's not fair economics. So that might be a short-term solution, but in the long term, let the market do its work. What difference would it make if you're saying let the market do its work? Because I'm seeing something here that happens with, clearly, if we use this fertilizer issue, right, as an example, or even the petrol issue, two things that touch on the economy in huge ways. That's true. We've seen what has happened with fuel in the last six days, and things have almost come to a standstill. We've seen food prices increase. We've seen transport go through the roof. We've seen so many things happen just because that fuel issue was touched. Same thing with agriculture. Farmers are not able to purchase this fertilizer because it is too expensive. Then it affects the crop yield, and then we are told there's no food in the barns. Then we must import, etc., etc. What difference would it make if you're saying let the market then determine the prices? What difference would we see? Remove a fuel subsidy, remove agriculture subsidies, then you would get uh, for, for fertilizer. How would things then change? You know, we, we, are, we are using politics to solve an economic problem. Mm. And let me start with oil. Why should we be talking about high oil prices in this country when we are producing oil? Should we not be the people exporting oil? Mm. Imagine if Kenya was producing oil because we have it here. Then we would simply be saying, instead of exporting this oil, let's take it to the Kenyan market. And that would stabilize the prices. And that's my argument, that we are, solving a, we are trying to solve a problem using the wrong solution. Mm. So let's go on with oil. Is a problem... See, you, you, people are arguing that by having subsidized oil, then everybody is benefiting. Because you, you are paying 130 instead of 150. Right. Mm. But who is paying the difference? The person who's buying the fuel. That is a problem. So how are you benefiting? Mm. You see, you might think that you're buying fuel at 130. But who is paying that subsidy? It is you and me. In fact, if you look at the pricing of oil, that subsidy that is being, the, being paid to the oil marketers is probably coming from your taxes. Mm. So you can see my distortion, that's the distortion I'm talking about. Mm. That at the end of the day, you think it's a subsidy, but somebody is paying for it. And there was another question you asked. It was about, not about oil, it was about what? About fertilizer, for example. Fertilizer. What difference would it make? Yes, a very interesting argument. I don't know whether you're a farmer. Well, you don't look like a farmer. Every African, every African is a farmer. <laughs> the, uh, <laughs> I don't look like a farmer. By design. <laughs> but if, if, you, if you have ever farmed, <laughs> and I do a bit of farming, mostly tree farming, who said that fertilizer is the most important factor in food production? Mm. Mm. It's what we hear that the cry is about yes, but, all the time. but it's only one of the many factors. Mm. Look at something like sub, land, land subdivision. Mm. We have subdivided land from very big pieces to small pieces. Yeah. That has affected productivity. So it's not just fertilizer. It's also a question of land subdivision. How much technology do we use in land production? Mm. So I think we are bringing fertilizers. We are bringing oil prices mm. for our own policy areas. 
And that's my simple argument that we are looking at today when tomorrow is more important. Mm. So even if fertilizers came today mm. and fertilizers started costing 1,000 a bag. Or if Kenya began to manufacture its own fertilizers for its own farmers. Yes. Do you think that will raise the productivity, will raise the, the amount of food in this country? Not significant. Because mm. the other factors we must consider. What would raise, and I'm sorry to interject, uh, Prof, but what would then raise? Because if we're after quantity as well as quality of crop and et cetera, et cetera, and the bane has always been fertilizer. I think fertilizer has been used as a dustbin. As a person who interacts with the farmers every day, that's just an excuse. Mm. For example, why can't you use natural manure? Why can't you use crop rotation? Why, can't, why, why must we focus so much on fertilizer? And remember, at the end of the day, fertilizer makes soil very tired mm -hmm. or fatigued. Yeah. So let's look at more modern ways of producing food. You mm. sound like the people who are also saying that Kenyans ought to stop looking at things like ugali as the only thing to consume. And then when there is a maize shortage, then everybody... Is a hungry. bit of a mess. I totally, hunger. I, I totally agree with you. Who said you must eat ugari? The other day, somebody came visiting my house and we had a lot of food. We couldn't finish it. In fact, 50% of the food was not eaten. That around 10, that gentleman tells me uh, in Swahili, chakura. So I, I think we need to start <laughs> looking at things from one <laughs> perspective. Let's be more open minded. So fertilizer is an excuse, mm. oil price is an excuse. Let's look at the main issues which is productivity in agriculture. Mm. Mm. Let's have a, a land that is commercially viable in terms of pro where we can use tractors, where we can use machines. But now land has been subdivided into very small pieces. Mm. If you uh, drive around Nairobi, the best land in Nairobi is not put into agricultural use. Westlands and uh, Upper Hill and so on. Mm. If I trees growing, there are very good ag agricultural land. Let's shift to a place like uh, Utawara. Let's move to, move to Mombasa Road. Very dry place. We cannot put it to better use. <laughs> let's remain, let's put we land leave around. Red Hill for crop yes, production. Yes, for crops and so on. The price of food will go down. Yeah. I know you may not want to go there to, to Kitengera and so on because it's not very, very prestigious. Yes. You want to live in a river suburb. But let's think about food security in this country. Mm. And let's stop bringing fertilizers. Let's take a break. It's half past seven. We have in the studio Professor Axan Iraqi, who is an economic analyst and lecturer at the University of Nairobi. We are talking about tomorrow's budget speech by the cabinet secretary Okuri Atani. What do we expect to see from the next financial uh, year's budget? That's what we're having a conversation over. We'll be back shortly. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Brought to you by Colgate. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The only way to live your best life is to create a balance between work, love, and play. Smoking shish and releasing things on your smoke like a small <laughs> Right. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And you want God to give you a man who has a mission and a vision. You may create an illusion of because he's younger, he's interested in me or he likes me, but he's using you. Text the word ADULT to 22840 to get the latest clips from adults in the room directly to your mobile phone. SMS ADULTS to 22840. The adults in the room. Spice FM. Oh, it's getting hot in here. Oh, everybody steals. Mm -hmm. It's better a thief mm -hmm. who brings something small back. Mm. And I say to myself, there's no better thief. A thief is a thief, period. All those bribes, how much they're getting by her, how much inconvenience they're causing, as much as you call it a small case, it's worth it to convict them. The truth is, we are a tribal nation. Because if we were not tribal, and I want to go back to this, mm -hmm. you cannot continue walking around with a mug which is clean outside and it's rotten inside. We have become a full laser country. Mm -hmm. We have mortgaged our country because of that. You've got one chef working, mm -hmm. and the assistant chef, Wakati and Atekana Kroge, Kroge, Unga, Nini, Ayuko. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. 
Cloudy conditions at 16 in Nairobi. We'll see highs of 26 today. It's mostly sunny at 18 in Nakuru. 29 will be the high and lows of 14. Cloudy at 13 in Nyeri. Highs of 26 and lows of 12. While it's cloudy in Eldoret at 21. 26 will be the high coming down to lows of 15. The sun is out in Mombasa at 27. Highs of 33 and lows of 26 today. While in Malindi, it's sunny at 27. Highs of 33 and lows of 26. We're looking at uh, cloudy conditions in Kisumu at 21. Highs of 31 and lows of 20. And we are looking at um, um, Kakamega at 19. Mostly cloudy conditions. We'll see highs of 32 and lows of 16. Out in Kampala, it's clear at 21. Highs of 29 and lows of 19. And we'll see sunny conditions in Dar es Salaam at 26. Highs of 32 and lows of 25. It's mostly sunny at 16. 23 with high and lows of 10. While in Lagos, it's clear at 28 with highs of 34. It's going to be highs of 34 as well in Kinshasa. It's currently cloudy at 22. Welcome to Spice FM, the best exclusive radio station, bringing you the best mix of the best music ever. All right, it's looking pretty messy coming off Mombasa Road today, and we're looking at it coming from the Way Bridge out towards the SGR. It's going to spill over towards um, General Motors, and then we're looking at some going uh, east towards the... Uh, um, outer ring and that is building up through the north airport road southern bypass looking pretty good there's an option for you to keep using all day every day um jogo road is pretty piled up past the makada train station out towards kaloleni and then the roundabout at the city stadium landis road is also taking a hit this morning going towards the kamkunji roundabout huru highway pretty busy as you get past the uh Nyayo stadium roundabout high through into the city and on the Thicker Super Highway, not too terrible this morning. We are seeing bumper to bumper traffic, though, just past that Mavari Junction out towards the city and also on Kiambu Road. Let's keep an eye on things. Talk to us on Spice FM KE on Twitter. Text 40127. Chilled Spice. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings, done 24 right. to 8, conversation continues. The situation room on Spice FM online, YouTube and Facebook and www.spicefm.co.ke. Eric Latif and Ndu Okot, CT Muga is away this week, he's taking a break. And our guest this morning, Professor Exan Iraqi, economic analyst and lecturer at the University of Nairobi. We are talking about the budget 2022-2023. Uh, it's going to be 3.31 trillion shillings. And tomorrow, Kuria Tani will be in Parliament talking about how he hopes to finance the 3.3 trillion shillings expenditure by government for the next 12 years from July. Uh, Prof, you're talking about you know what we keep saying you know subsidies let's deal with it today people people don't have uh, food on the table today but you said this is exposing a failure in proper policy formulation and implementation the last four years we've been financing largely the big four agenda and the cs for the national treasury uh, both Rotich and Yatani have been saying the big four agenda is this administration's key driver of development one of the pillars of the Big Four agenda is food security. Now, Okuri Tani has said, we will continue financing the Big Four agenda. And if we look back at what has happened in the, over the last four years, we have made a lot of progress in policy formulation, policy review, uh, setting uh, uh, mechanisms in place to help us achieve um, all this. If we look at housing, there is a mortgage refinance corporation that has been established. If you look at healthcare, we have reviewed and revamped uh, what's it called? NHIF. Mm -hmm. If you look at agriculture then, there's an economic agricultural sector uh, growth strategy. The agricultural sector transformation and growth strategy 2019 to 2029. Let me just read for you the nine flagships of this strategy which is being rolled out by the government. Flagship number one, anchor one to increase small scale farmer, pastoralist and fisher folk income. Anchor 2, to increase agricultural output and value addition. Anchor 3, to boost household food resilience and enable us launching three skill programs for 200 government leaders, 
flagship implementers, 3,000 youth-led and digitally enabled extension agents, flagship eight, strengthening research and innovation, uh, flagship nine, monitoring two key food system risks, that those addressing sustainability and climate, and a second category for crisis management for pests, diseases, global price stocks. If you look at it, that sounds holistic, like it's looking at how do we get this country into a food secure country. Mm. It's being implemented. These are great ideas and no question about it, but they must trickle down to the grassroots. Mm. I'll give you a good example. When I was a young boy, I, I always used to see extension officers coming to help my dad improve his productivity. They taught him how to make silage for keto so mm. that the keto can survive during the dry season. Mm. They taught him how to make furrows to stop soil erosion. And I want to hear how many people have seen an extension officer in their farm in the last 10 years. So these are great ideas, but great ideas must cascade to the grassroots. Mm -hmm. If you look at agriculture, it gives about 25% of the GDP. How much credit from banks go to that area? If you look at the same agriculture, how many students nowadays want to study, agri to study agriculture in the university? They want to study other things. As a first choice, right? As a first choice. Mm -hmm. In fact, I, 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 would, I would challenge you with your colleague here, mm. if, uh, today, and I'm, I'm, I'm going to, to give you a very good gift, if you can get me a business card mm. with a title farmer. Mm. So farming is very important. We talk <laughs> about it at the national level, yeah. but we don't really take it with the seriousness that it deserves. Mm. Those policies are great, but let my mother, let the people on the grassroots feel it. And if they do that, we are going to see security. So we does it mean security. that the, all the money that has gone into the Big Four agenda has been going to the wrong areas, wrong areas of the Big Four agenda? Uh, maybe, maybe it has not been going to the wrong area, mm. but it has taken too long to arrive at the final destination. Mm. It's just like the money we talk about in devolution. A mm. lot of money comes from the central government to the devolved the units, mm -hmm. but we see the effect. Sure. Maybe that money is put, goes to the devolution, the devolved units, goes to agriculture, but not to where it matters most. And I'll give you an example of extension. Mm. Mm. I'll give you an, an, extent, an example of preparing the next generation of farmers. If you look at young men today, who is going to farm tomorrow? They don't want to be farmers. If you go to other countries, people are very proud to be farmers. Mm. Here we are not. Mm. So I think we have, put, we, have, we have the money, but we have not put it where it matters. And interestingly enough, then farming contributes to agriculture, which we are saying is propping up the economy 30 to 40 percent. Uh, it, it's what is touted to. Now, if we look at the Big Four agenda, now in terms of the budget, every year since 2018, a significant amount of money from the budget has gone towards the Big Four. Now, the question is, I mean, even asking this question yesterday, is the output commensurate to the input then of funds? Now, going forward, should we say then it makes sense to see a reduction of that funding? Because clearly... Nobody's really excited right now about the state of things. And when we're coming into a budget year, it would be prudent then of those who are in the process to say, hold on, folks, perhaps our attention should be focused somewhere else. Now, if the Big Four agenda has taken up quite a chunk of this money in the last four years, should we be looking forward and saying, let's focus on the two that are important and give some more attention to the things that have obviously been suffering for the last 12 months, 24 months? That's, that's a very politically rooted question because the big four is a part of Uhuru Kenyatta, President Uhuru Kenyatta's legacy. Mm. <coughs> you have to remember this, that before we got the big four, we had Vision 2030, and the big four was derived from Vision 2030. Right. Mm. So we secured the big, the big things in Vision 2030 into big four. Mm. So you're, you're now saying we move from big four to maybe the big two or maybe mm. the big one. And I'm worried because you'll soon say big nothing. <laughs> but, I mean, but, <laughs> but, but I think you have a very good argument mm. that if something is not working, we need to do something about it. Yeah. So the big question is whether the next president, whether it is Raira Odinga or William Ruto, is going to stop funding Big Four. Mm. My hunch tells me that uh, it might change when they come to power. Mm. But I see Big Four being funded in the current government as a part of policy projects as a part of legacy, but I think the next president will probably change that. For in the, under the current circumstances, I don't think it is changing. Don't you think even the president Uhuru Kenyatta should just sit back and ask himself, so when I leave office and I say there was big four and those were my legacy projects, what is it that I can point and people can say, you know, that was yes. Uhuru's legacy and yes. it was big four. They directly pointed that. 
We will have the I expressway, can point, for example. I can point at the expressway from here. The expressway <coughs> will be direct. That is Uhuru's legacy. Yes. Okay. But you show me manufacturing, housing, food security, uh, healthcare. Health. What is it that people will sit back and say, Nyewe, Uhuru moved us from this point to the other? I, I think uh, we need to be fair to President Uhuru. Mm. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't support as me, I don't support UDA. I'm a political observer. Mm. But you need to be fair. I think it is important you let other people judge you when you leave office. <coughs> we did that with President uh, Kibaki. Kibake. We did that with President uh, Arap Moy. Mm. We did that with Yomo Kenyatta. So I think let President Uhuru hand over the government to the next president. Mm. Then when, when he is out of the office, we can now say, this is your legacy. But I think your question still uh, makes, makes sense. Out of all that funding for those projects, what are the tangible results? You see, to Anjiko and Kamau and Mwandoe and uh, Onyango, they may not even read the budget tomorrow. They may not even know what the big four is. The question mm -hmm. they'll be asking is, do I have money in the pocket? Mm -hmm. Can I feed my family? Can I pay my rent? And I think at the end of the day, the success of any project should be measured with those small things. Mm -hmm. Because that's what matters to me. Mm -hmm. the, the big ideas are good for academics and other and policy makers. Mm -hmm. For the owner Mwananchi, it is what money is in my pocket. So I think it is too early to judge the success of Big Four, in my opinion. Because government projects and times take a long time mm. before we see the success. We bashed Thika Road. Now it is packed with cars. We bashed SGR. Now all of us are taking a read at the coast. So I think uh, sometimes as a politician, you have to take bold steps and let people in the future judge your ideas and your projects. It is not always fair to let the current generation judge your success. True, Prof. But there's always milestones. You know, you can see, yes, we are heading towards Mombasa. We are at least in Emali. Yes. And you can clearly see this is not where I started. I started in the Degua. This is Emali. It's different. But with the big four, would we be able to say that we have moved? These are the milestones that we've been able to achieve. And this, like you say, rightly, it should not necessarily be the president coming to say this is where we started, this is where we are, but the others who should be doing that. The National Treasury, for example, should be reporting to Parliament and saying, when we started financing the Big Four in the first budget of 2018-2019, we put in X amount of money. This is what we have. And now we are building on to it. Parliament should be able to have a report that says, that shows. But even the Parliamentary Budget Office keeps saying, we don't know what we are achieving with the Big Four. We cannot quantify and say this is what we've achieved. And yet we keep Academia such it. as yourselves, mm. Professor, you should be able to come back and say, you know what, we can clearly see this, this, is, this is a progress. I'm trying to pin you down to actually main, name one progress that you can say, we started here, we're here. And I'm not getting it. Uh, I think you are, you, 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 you are deliberately trying me to, you are trying, deliberately trying to make me carry the burdens of this country <laughs> and yes. the burdens of all the academia. Yes. And I'll not do that because I can't do that. But let's be realistic. Mm. I think a big fall from its conception derived from Vision 2030 was a great idea because you cannot do everything. So right. just do what you think is important. Even, you, even yourself when you're at home or in your own home, you don't do everything. Yep. You come up with priority projects. I think the question we are debating is whether those are the right priority projects. In my mm. opinion, healthcare is a good area to focus on because a healthy nation is a productive nation. Indeed. So there's no question about that. Mm. What you should be asking is whether it has been implemented the right way. Yeah. And my observation was the big four was not really debated enough. We would have had more feedback from the voters, from the citizens. So they say, this is why we think it matters most. Mm. When it comes to food security, we should also have been more involved so that we say this is why it matters most in housing and all the other sectors. But this is where we are. We have put money into Big Four. The president will be leaving office in the next few months. Mm -hmm. And we, see we, are, we, we are asking whether the next president will carry over from there. I think it's, it's not very good to throw away projects halfway. My uh, observation should be, let's finish what we set out to do and then we set new priorities. Because mm. if now we come with the next president and he starts his own project and leave the big four unfinished, we are in deeper, in, we, we are in deeper problems. Mm. And I'm not here to defend politicians because I'm not one. Mm. I'm here to defend common sense. And I think... And economic common sense. I, I'd agree with you, Prof. Um, very many people have questioned whether the big four were the right priorities to focus on. And very many have said, 
if you look at food security, that's big. If you look at health, that's big. I mean, those are key burdens that Kenyans bear. If you look at housing, it's big, um, and that is futuristic. If you look at manufacturing, it's big because you're talking about job creation. My issue, though, is with the implementation. Have we been able, like, have we applied that shilling in the best way possible? Are we able to say that we put in money? We talked about this. There was a report that went, well, the budget policy statement goes to uh, members of the National Assembly. The Committee on Budget and Implementation comes back and says, in fact, the Parliamentary Budget Office is telling us money went into some project. One of the flagship projects in, uh, was supposed to be in Athi River, mm. some tannery in Athi River. Money went into that tannery in, in Athi River to date. There's no tannery in the river. Of it. Why? Because first they went and built in a swamp. It rained. They realized, oh my God. A tannery sunk. <laughs> I think I tell you where the problem is. Mm. Some of you look very religious from your eyes. I'm not very sure about your religion. Mm. But we always <laughs> say you cannot put uh, new wine in old skins. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's a mistake we made. We came up with big ideas, a big form. But did we change the infrastructure, the, our mental infrastructure? our political infrastructure, our social infrastructure to fit into the big four. Mm. I think that's the biggest mistake we made. For example, if you look at something like uh, health, the core of health is people to pay little money and when you pay 500 shillings, you are sure you can get, health, you can be, be treated in any clinic or any hospital in this country. Yes. But as we are saying that, we are saying the health system is devolved. So if I'm from uh, Kiambu and I'm going to another hospital in Tharakanithi, mm -hmm. someone might say I'm not from there. So we, we need to have changed our social infrastructure, our management structure, our economic structure to, make, to take care of the big four. I don't think we did that. We are still implementing big four with the old mentality. Mm. I can also give another example of something like manufacturing. If you say this country should become an, um, a manufacturing nation, which I think is a good idea because manufacturing creates a lot of jobs. Did we, for example, go to the universities and tell them we need manufacturing, so we need more graduates in engineering. So we need less people, for example, in social sciences, but more people in this area. So that by the time we, we set a factory, we are sure we can get engineers. We can get people who can design machines. We, can desi we have people who can go and market those new products and improve the quality so that instead of demanding something from China or from Germany, you demand something from Kenya. If you go to housing, we said we want more housing, but are we using appropriate materials? I want to give you a very good, good example of where I grew up, mm. and I'm not going to disclose for security reasons. <laughs> <laughs> but when Muzungu came here, mm. came there around 1940s and 30s, guess what he did? And you cannot believe this. He built houses using mud. And those houses are still intact. Mm. 100 years later. Now, when we build houses today, what do we use? Every woman must use brocks. Mm. Mm -hmm. Every woman must use iron sheets. Why do, we, why, we do, why do we use such expensive materials in a country like Kenya that is very, very warm? In fact, my argument has been we should use the cheapest material in this country. But guess why we build houses are expensive in this country? Mm. You cannot believe it's because of insecurity. Mm. If you improved security, I don't need that brock wall. I don't need that metal gate. Housing will become very cheap. So if you look at all these big four, there is something we don't do right. There is something we don't do in, in enough research about. And quote any of them, I would tell you would have improved on this. Mm. So I think if we put deeper thought mm. into the big four, mm. they would have been cheaper to implement, would have been having more milestones, and would be much happier. I mean, uh, it's uh, important to just sound out these things. One thing that uh, it worries me is in the language, uh, as even looking at the budget now, the language around the presentation of the budget worries me sometimes, especially when the cabinet secretary uses words like, we hope to get these funds <laughs> from here or there. Mm. That means that as we currently speak and as I present this budget to you. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, Neither do we have this money. <laughs> but uh, one of the most important <laughs> items you sell as a politician is hope. Uh. Right. Now, Just like preachers. We are, this is true. H however, there are 47 million plus people hinged on this hope. And unfortunately, they will have to bear the brunt of this uh, responsibility when it comes to the hope that the CS now is putting out there. Now, when you have a budget based on hope, for example, that means you're not sure. 
that you may not even have an inkling where this money will come from because you're currently in the doldrums. Governors are asking for 150 billion shillings today. You don't have enough money right now to feed your country's hungry. You are not able to pay oil marketers. You've paid them some money today. But come the 14th of April, we are going to go back to where we were yesterday. So even as you are preparing and forecasting for the next fiscal year, you are still in the pit. So when you're saying, I hope that this will happen and this money will come from where, I, I, am, I am worried and I am concerned. And should we be, and then should you budget with money that you do not have? The way you ask that question uh, makes give me an impression that you're a part-time preacher. You, yeah. you, you, you talk a lot of passion <laughs> about hope and prospects. <laughs> I, I think one of the biggest problems we have in this country is that sometimes we are not very realistic. And mm. People need to be realistic. I cannot sell hope to my children, hope that I will pay school fees, hope that I will buy you clothes, hope that I will pay you rent. We should be realistic. Yes. But I think, uh, remember, a budget to some extent is a political document. Mm. So you should not be so exact because we are going to pin you down. Well, the, there must be something at least. Yes, right? there must be something. But, but I think what we need to do in this when it comes to budgeting is to be very realistic. Mm. We say this is the money that we have. These are the needs that we have. And we must balance, balance them. <laughs> For example, why do we always have unbalanced budget? We always have a deficit. And even, sh sh I can tell you that the budget being read tomorrow, there will be mm -hmm. a budget deficit. Mm -hmm. So why can't, be why can't we be realistic and say, this is the money we have, this is what we can do, right. instead of hope. But remember that as a politician, you cannot do that. You must sell you must people. Sell hope. Yes, you must sell hope. And it's not bad, because what is wrong with, with, with aspiring? It's good to be aspire. It's good to aspire. It's good to dream. Because some of those dreams turn into reality. But as an economist, I wish we were more realistic. I wish we came up with a budget that we can afford, that we can pay for. Has there not been a budget deficit in the reading of the budget for the last five years? Even tomorrow there will be. Right. I can guarantee you. Yeah. But the question is, where do we get the money to cover this budget, budget deficit? Mm. Mm. And what I've found is that every government rolls over the budget to the next one. Mm. So that you borrow money, somebody will pay it. A and we need to move... Maybe, maybe the parliamentary should come up with a, with a new role that budget must always be balanced. Mm. And not just at the national level, but at the county level, mm. so that we live within our means. What's to say then of a nation, for example, that needs to complete last year? Well, all right, so coming into budget 2021, the, the development partners had to give some money that then enabled the country to basically close the year because there was no money to do it. What's to say then of a nation that needs to get this donor support to be able to complete its own budget, its own national budget? I, I think I, I want to, to turn that debate loud, that a budget is ours. Mm. We are the people who come up with it. We are the people who write it. Mm -hmm. We are the people who consult in parliament and elsewhere and come up with a budget. We even call for public participation. Right. So in view of that, a budget should be very realistic. Mm. And I think this country needs to become more proud so that we, we fired more of our budget. Mm -hmm. During Kebaki's era, we almost did that. But remember that to fund the budget, we need to pay more taxes. Mm -hmm. So we, maybe we need to be more patriotic so that we, may, we, we pay more taxes. We have more people put into tax bracket. Mm -hmm. We have less tax leakage. Mm -hmm. So that at the end of the day, we reduce the budget deficit. Mm -hmm. We are a very proud country. We are going to finish our projects. We are going to have more Kenyans being pulled from poverty. Okay, you may say that is hope, but it is good to be hopeful. So me, I believe we can do better than we are doing mm -hmm. by being realistic. You know, he Le doesn't look very happy. Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> it didn't start the day well. I don't know who has annoyed me. I agree with you. <laughs> my, my, what I want to conclude the conversation with is it is quite telling that we haven't had much input from the Raila Odinga campaign or from the William Ruto campaign on what they should, they hope to see in the budget. Rallying their troops. This is what we expect you to look out for from the speech. And this is what we'd like you to push this, the, the, the budget towards. Because they know it's either Raila or Ruto that's going to implement this budget. That's a fact. And that they are all quiet. It's like they're sitting there waiting for... When, when it happens, we'll deal with it. We'll spend three trillion shillings. I love to see it. 
uh, if you remember <laughs> when we were starting the debate, that's exactly what I, I said. Mm. I would like to see what is the budget tomorrow and what's the input from UDA side and from Azimio side. Because mm. whether we want or not, you are right. They are the people who implement it. And it surprises me that they're not putting input into what they implement. Unless they know something I don't know, yeah. they should be the most vocal people. Right telling now. us this is not the budget, this is the budget. Yep. But uh, remember, as a good politician, you don't say too much. <laughs> we might be holding your cards close uh, to your chest. Yes, you yes. will be held account. Now so, you have something to to blame it on. You see, I inherited a budget that <laughs> could not have helped me do this. I think uh, that's the river it. Ah, uh, Prof, we thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, Let's watch this, and then we'll come back again soon to look at implementation of these budgets. If you have a very good conversation on that day, Asante, mm. I will be the first person to read it from cover to cover uh -huh. and tell you whether I should smile or frown or, or frown or both. Sour. Oh, a very good morning. Thank Professor you. X and Iraqi is an economic analyst and also a lecturer at the University of Nairobi. He's been talking to us. We are waiting for tomorrow's budget when Ukuri Atani will be in parliament to present how he hopes to raise 3.3 trillion shillings to finance the government in the next one year. Very good morning to you, 8 a.m. up your life the latest news from around the world 94.4 spice fm this is news around dense etc Counties face an ineligible pending bills of more than 108 billion shillings of the total pending bills of 155 billion shillings. According to the Auditor General, county executives and county assemblies have 107 billion shillings and 1 billion shillings as ineligible pending bills respectively. County executives face an ineligible pending bills of 45.5 billion shillings while the county assemblies have 1.9 billion shillings in their books. The control of budget Margaret Nyakango says the huge amount has partly been attributed by suppliers. Now the count Council of Governors has raised a red flag over the increasing number of people facing starvation in 24 drought hit counties. The council's vice chairperson NKC Governor James Ongwai said that due to the drought situation over 3.1 million people are currently food insecure warning that the situation will worsen if necessary interventions are not undertaken. The council urged the national government to enhance its support to the affected counties so as to alleviate the suffering of the people. This, as Kakamega Governor Wycliffe Oparanya now says counties affected by the drought are incapable of solving the menace on their own without intervention from the national government. Governor Oparanya says that counties such as Turkana have been overwhelmed by the drought and the state should respond to the situation with haste. While narrating his experience in Turkana, Oparanya described the situation as saddening, calling on the national government to treat it as an emergency. And the United Democratic Alliance Party is set to conduct an aspirants meeting in 34 counties today. In a notice posted on its Twitter handle, the party said the meeting will be presided over by county returning officers appointed by the National Elections Board. The officers will brief the participating aspirants of the upcoming party nominations. And Wiper Party leader Kalonzo Musyoka has hinted that the Azmiya La Umoja One Kenya political party is mulling fielding a single candidate for the gubernatorial race in the cities of Nairobi, Mombasa and Nakuru. Musioka states that the coalition risks being disadvantaged if all the affiliate parties fielded their own respective candidates. He, however, noted that the elective seats in other regions will be competitive with all parties allowed to field their own candidates. Now, three voters have petitioned the Orange Democratic Movement Party, accusing it of clearing Karoli Omonde to contest for the Super South Parliamentary seat after the stipulated time. Omonde is a former chief of staff to Azimio presidential candidate Raila Odinga, and he vied for the Super South Parliamentary seat in the past election but lost to incumbent MP John Buddy. In a petition addressed to the party's National Elections Board Chairperson Catherine Muma, the three voters, Henry Ogola, Michael Utieno and Joshua Soto, argue that Omonde quit the party after the 2017 general election and if at all he rejoined, it must have been past the March 26th deadline. 
Five women and two men facing charges of female genital mutilation will remain in custody at the Mukuruina police station for two days pending a court ruling on their bail application. The seven suspects who appeared before resident Majestu Damaklin Bosibori Yakundi were arrested over suspected FGM practice. Police had rescued eight girls, six of whom are believed to have undergone the cat at the home of the suspected suspects rather, who is said to have escaped the dragnet. And a court in the United Arab Emirates has sentenced an Israeli woman to death after she was found guilty of possessing 500 grams of cocaine. The woman, named by Israel media as 43-year-old Fida Kewan, is appealing the sentence. In a statement, the Israeli foreign minister said they are aware of the case and that they are handling it through the consular service and their representatives in the Emirates. Israeli media reported that Kewan, who owns a photography studio in Haifa in northern Israel, came to Dubai for work about a year ago. She was arrested a week later after police found the cocaine in the apartment she was staying in. Kiwan reportedly claimed the drugs weren't hers. This is Newswire. I'm Dennis Aceto. Good morning. One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. On the Fika Superhighway this morning is where we see a lot of action and we're going towards the Pangani underpass. It's going to take some time to get out of this one. Uh, not too crazy coming off of that outer ring junction. We are seeing some traffic on Kiambu Road. Uh, not as crazy as it has been in the past few days, but all the same. There's still some bumper-to-bumper -bumper action happening there. Uh, also looking at it, it's really heavy on Waiaki Way today going out then towards Ring Road Westlands. Um, as your way out into the city, that has slowed down some. Uh, coming off of Uhuru Highway then through to the city and then into Westlands. That is also doing its thing. Uh, Langata Road is looking very good today. There's a dot, dot, dot of traffic on Rilo Dinga Way, uh, but nothing too painful right now. Coming off Mombasa Road, your normal morning traffic shouldn't cause too much of an issue. But the Eastern Bypass is taking on quite some as well. Outer Ring looks pretty good. Getting into the city, use that as an option. Running away from Mombasa Road. Let's keep an eye on things this morning. Talk to us on Spice FMKE on Twitter. Text 40127. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial in the room we have ct muga researcher academic seasoned political observer a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times ndu oko nigerian by birth kenyan by choice communications expert pan africanist a truth seeker and believer in people power and eric latin Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only Seven way to minutes start after eight your day. On the 6th day of April 2022, welcome to the third hour of Kenya's biggest conversation. And we thank you very much for, for watching, wherever you are watching us, whether it's on YouTube and Facebook, Spice FM KE, our website, www.spicefm.co.ke, or on KTN Home, that we are live now for the next one hour. If you're tuned in on radio, Spice FM around the country, Nairobi, Mombasa, Nakuru, Kisumu, Eldoret, Nyeri, Malindi. Good morning, Karibu Sana. This time, let's talk about citizen action as we head towards the general election. We have two guests in the studio and they'll tell us about a campaign they're running called Tugutuke. They'll tell us about that. But before we introduce them, today's proverb is still from Malawi. City Muga has a proverb. Right. Well done. <laughs> when you are crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. When you're crossing over the river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself be bitten by the small fish. Mm. It has very many translations. Everybody's just thinking, okay. Professor Exxon Iraqi was here and he was telling us, eat the fish. <laughs> <laughs> eat the big ones. Where, where, where did you hear where in, in Malawi that there's fish that eat people in Malawi? 
<laughs> which fish is going to bite you in Malawi. Mm. David Kabeberi is an advisor with the Tugutuke Movement and Judy Wango is also an advisor with Tugutuke Movement. Thank you very much for joining us, David and Judy. Karibuni sana. It's Kenya's biggest conversation. Thank you very much for having us here. Mm. You, you say Asante, Judy. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Thank you for having us. It's, it's a whole process. <laughs> when someone tells you Karibu, you don't just say <laughs> When you hear that proverb, Judy, mm -hmm. from Malawi, mm -hmm. when you're crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself be bitten by the small fish. What comes to mind? Um, what comes to mind is don't bother the small the small issues, you know, like it kind of also, also sounds like um, usually you have bigger fish to fry, like you have bigger things to worry about mm. than the small things. Don't sweat the small stuff. Yes. Is that the same thing you think of, David? Well, for me, being an accountant, mm. I transfer to the money side uh -huh. and say, uh, look after the pennies and the pounds will look after themselves. Right. Uh. Mm. That is a good say again. Uh, so look after the pennies. And now, now you you know you introduce a new accountancy proverb. <coughs> so can you just translate it? Chunga ma penny, ma pesa yatajichu. Yatajichunga. Yatajichunga. Don't let yourself be bitten by the small fish. Yeah. All right, as you there the are wondering about the the crocodiles, mm. take care of the small ones. Mm. And the big ones will also take care of themselves. Mm. Of course, if you're making sure that you're not bitten by the little fish, you're also watchful for the crocodile. I think that's a good one. Thank you very much, David. And on that note, tell us about the Tugutuke movement. What is it about? Um, Eric, the Tugutuke movement, um, and as you see in the title, I'm really just the advisor. Mm. Is, is an effort by very young people. Started around November last year mm -hmm. when it became clear that there was a serious increase in the apathy towards Putin. And these young people were concerned that um, if we are giving up on voting, are we giving up on the country? And wh whose country is it anyway? Mm. Um, <clears throat> and so they began to speak amongst themselves. There's a group of about 20 um, people, including Judy here. Mm. They range from age of 22 to, to 35, thereabouts. Mm. Um, so they are, the, they are the ones we call... Very young uh, people. Very young people. <laughs> Youthy. I, I myself, I'm, I'm young. Mm -hmm. It's just I've got a little more experience than most other people. Mm. <laughs> And so they, they began to talk amongst themselves, uh, you know, what can we do? Should we leave it or should we begin to, to take an action ourselves? And in the conversations, they were able to conclude or maybe determine that a lot of the problems that we have in terms of political um, leadership in the country mm. comes from the inability to hold um, MPs, and MCAs, the representatives, accountable mm. uh, to a point where we now sort of almost acknowledge that we elect people to go and eat. Mm. And, and we actually do it. We wake up in the morning and we go and elect so-and-so to go and eat. Mm. Um, and hopefully they'll share something with us. They, they, they do, mm. once every five years. Yes. <laughs> a little bit of it. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, the, the, there is a study that shows that the average spend for people running for MP is 35 million uh, shillings. Mm -hmm. So I suppose in that, 35 million is, is the sharing, mm. uh, but it's ob obviously a small drop in the big ocean. So the, the quest then was how do we achieve um, this accountability? Mm -hmm. um, recognizing that um, in, in the way, and, and it's very hard for even young people because we don't all understand the new constitution mm -hmm. and what it means. Mm -hmm. And I'm calling it new and it is 2010. Mm -hmm. uh, but for a lot of people, constitution at all is new. Yep. You know, most people haven't read it, haven't understood it, and, and understand government um, from the way it is presented to them by MPs, MCAs, the president, and everybody. Mm. So, so the realization that, in fact, the important person 
in our political life is the MP and the MCA is, is a bit hard. Mm. Um, <clears throat> I think the 2010 constitution deliberately gave very little power to the president mm. and transferred most of the power to, to the assemblies, to mm. the national assembly and the county assembly. Mm. Um, this concept wasn't properly put out to people. Mm. We think that the president and the minister and the treasury own the budget. The budget belongs to the, to the parliament, and parliament owns it on behalf of the people. Mm. It is, it is uh, the, the parliament that determines what should be done. And in doing so, parliament represents the citizen, yeah. the, the owner of the money, the taxpayer. Yeah. Mm. So we pay tax, then we say to the, the, the parliament, uh, go and go and have this money spent in this way. Make sure it is spent well. Yes. Mm. Uh, and so they, they allocate the money. They call it appropriate. Um, but yesterday I, did, I was watching a TV uh, a show. I think it, it had two MPs on it. Mm. And there was a quarrel as to whether when the government uses the money for a different thing, whether it's misappropriation <laughs> or whether it's misapplication. <laughs> <laughs> But they appropriate this money and say, please use this money for this purpose. Mm. And then the other function of parliament is to ensure it is used for that purpose. purpose yes. mm. What we call the oversight. Mm. Um, again, representing uh, the people. Mm. And, and then there is the function of creating law, mm. which, which is um, really determining how do we behave towards one another. Mm. And again, that is something that you can only do representing people because it is us who agree on what the law should be. Now, <clears throat> what has happened over time is that when the MPs are not accountable to their voters, um, it gives them the opportunity to follow their own interests. Mm. It, it means that um, they, they can follow their own interests, whether it is um, going into bed with, with the executive so that then the oversight is reduced, yeah. um, going to bed with the executive so that, in fact, the, the programs that, that are, the parliament is approving are the executives programs um, and eventually allowing even the executive to use up uh, power. parliament itself yeah and other powers mm. <coughs> excuse me so you saw recently um, the BBI ruling was very significant in, in saying that the president cannot uh, commence a popular change to the constitution mm. that is a function that has been given to the citizen, this, yes, and it's a right of the citizen. And the president, by being president, is not Mwananchi wa Kawaida. He's not Wanjiko. Let's bring in Judy into the conversation. A mm -hmm. uh, very good introduction of how the very young people, <laughs> according to David Kababeri, came together and they started asking themselves the questions. And then you came up with the answer on Tugutuke. So why Tugutuke? Like he said, huh? It's common knowledge that we've decided to be, the youth especially, has decided to be apathetic and they've decided they don't, they no longer want to deal with the government, mm. which is actually doing a disservice to ourselves, so to say. So we thought that um, it is about time we take our country back from the political elite, you know, the 3,000 or so mm. people who have decided will be the one who decides for us. So I'm urging the youth not to give up. Mm. We still have a chance using the ballot. We can still take our country back. Do you think, do you think there is adequate interest from younger people or the younger people to see that government is put in place that then is going to make sure that their needs, livelihoods protected, needs met, uh, you know, uh, life secured? Do you think there's adequate interest to push that particular agenda from the youth who we're always told is the larger percentage of the population? Yeah, I think there is because then these conversations will not be happening because what is happening even on the social media, you find we are constantly complaining about what is not happening. Mm -hmm. But we don't have a solution. We don't have a mechanism of making these people accountable and have, have them work for us like they're supposed to. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I think there's interest. Okay. Yeah. Now, is the call to be more active in the political processes mm -hmm. or is the call to 
present yourselves as candidates to then sit in positions of leadership? It's to both. Mm. To both. Be because um, growing up, we kept being told how we are the leaders of tomorrow. For me, I feel tomorrow is here. Mm. We, it's about time we take charge. We, 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 we position ourselves, you mm. know, mm. so that we, we are able to take the country to the next level. Mm. Yeah. What do you think, uh, David, even going now towards August, uh, are activities then that need to happen or that are currently, that younger people that are currently involved in towards this agenda, clearly that's being pushed now? Um, <clears throat> and before I answer that, I have to just pick up that um, Eric and I also belong to a generation which was the leaders of tomorrow. Mm. Tomorrow is still coming. It's <laughs> not yet. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but uh, <clears throat> I mean, right now, the, the we have to recognize that there are there has been very strong political activity for the last three years, maybe four years. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that activity has been around the presidency. And it's much of that activity that creates the, the, the impression that the big thing to worry about is, is who are we electing as president. For, as president. Who is this one guy, Messiah, coming to sort out all, uh, our all of us? Mm. Uh, and, and then, you know, it's op open, open secret that everybody's wondering whether the, the front runners, either of them, are, are that Messiah. Um, but what we are really saying is that it really ought not to matter that much which of the messiahs is elected if the system below them... If the disciples... If the disciples <laughs> are, are, are discipling, are working, <laughs> are, are, are delivering the bread. Mm. Um, because if parliament is doing its oversight role and representing the people and, and being... Um, an, organized, an institution that actually is looking at the interests of, of the people as a whole, then the president can only be sobered. You know, mm. if, if the system works the, at some place where the president is a bad president, it will, it will stop. Yeah. Uh, but if you don't have the, 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 the parliamentary um, independence or oversight, then a bad president will go bad all, all the way. So what needs to happen now is for, is for, for us and, and other Kenyans to wake up and realize that we really need to be deliberate mm. about who we are electing as, as MPs, mm. as MCAs. The MCAs are also very important because remember they are the ones who are on the ground. Mm. <clears throat> but also remember that the current allocation of budget to the counties is only 15%. Mm. So there's 85% that, that is looked after by this uh, smaller assembly called uh, the National Assembly, which has 290 plus about 80 mm. uh, MPs. So they both are important at their levels. And we need to move uh, towards recognizing the importance of that and get Kenyans to, to agree, to actually deliberately examine who are you voting for, mm -hmm. If you ask most Kenyans, and I've done this, mm. and I deliberately do this all the time, I ask them, who is your MP? Who did you vote for? Yep. And most people say, I actually don't know. <laughs> right. I, don't, I, I ticked a box with the right color. Especially so those in the urban areas. Yes, oh. yeah, because oh. it is the, the six piece and all that sort of mm. stuff. But I'm happy to say that we are finding also in talking with people that they are recognizing um, <clears throat> that this, this what we are saying. Uh, and now most people are saying we are not going to vote um, six, six piece okay. anymore. We w we do want to see who is our MP, mm. uh, but what is the mechanism by which it can make a difference? The the other um, thing that we need to think about is how do these MPs, how are they supposed to be accountable to to the people? Mm. Um, and the constitution created a, a, a political system that depended on political parties. So that the political parties, which belong to the people, mm -hmm. or should belong to the people, mm. uh, nominate MPs, and it is these MPs who then push the party agenda in the House. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and there was provision for, for those parties to be strong, uh, democratic, and independent organizations. The same MPs have made small little changes to the Constitution mm. that have enabled them to own the parties. The parties. 
So that now it, it is their party. It is not. A, it's not a member's party. No, it is a leader's party. Yes, mm. and and it's often owned by one or two people. Mm. Yeah. Um, and the, the result then is that you know they can't look to the parties to 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 be the ones managing the MPs, mm. and so Tugutuke is actually offering to manage uh, uh, MPs and MCAs who agree uh, in writing, in a pledge to the people, to honestly and truly represent the people. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and they will send a pledge um, to do so. The pledge is not about building roads and things like that, because mm -hmm. it's not the MP's job to, to build a road or yeah. a school. Yeah. It, neither is it the president's, incidentally, to go mm. and decide that the road from here to here will be repaired tomorrow because mm. I'm very upset that mm. uh, that my friend lives in a place where the road is not working. <laughs> <laughs> it's not his function. <laughs> so, <clears throat> so, the, the, um, so the pledge is that I will be accountable to the people yes. that put me in parliament. Yes. Mm -hmm. And does the pledge have any mechanisms for what if I'm not accountable? So the pledge is I will be a, I'll be a true representative okay. of the people and represent your wishes. Mm -hmm. I will meet with the people at least three times a year mm -hmm. so that we have we can exchange this uh, what what we are doing in parliament and what would you like me to go and say. Mm -hmm. I will not be engaged in business with the government and neither will I influence government business. That's things answering really to to the chapter six and integrity and things like that mm -hmm. uh, and a few other things. Um, <clears throat> including supporting the reforms that we need, because there are reforms that are uh, that are necessary. Mm. Some of which were included in in the BBI um, in terms of constitutional reform that were positive. Um, I'm not going to comment about the others, but mm. there are needs. There's need for reform. Mm. There is need for to complete the implementation of the constitution. Mm -hmm. There are some areas where we have been very shy about implementing. So we need these guys who are <coughs> accountable to the people to also undertake to support um, people-led reform and, and implementation. And this is a pledge to be signed by the candidates? By yeah. the candidate. As they are seeking your vote? Yes. And you're telling them, come and sign this <coughs> pledge that you're going to be a good person should I give you my vote? Yes. And if I don't, if I'm not that good person, uh. I will resign. <laughs> David, you know <laughs> we're all laughing because I mean they will go in there they will, they even currently the law requires them to sign even wealth declaration forms and all those things and you yeah. shall be declaring your wealth every every year you shall be renewing this mm. but we know what happens it sounds like so a, a member of parliament coming to promise you at yeah. what it sounds Aki. like I will. It I sounds will like a, a Jacob person. and Esau, yeah. Esau ah. moment <laughs> when Esau was so hungry and he said you know what I'll give you this food if you sign over your birthright to me. At that point, all this fella is thinking is that he needs to eat. Yes. So he's going to sign any, he's going to give off everything. And he gave away his birthright, essentially. So it just sounds like it's at that moment where essentially what you're telling me is that you will give me your vote if I sign this thing. Just this thing. <laughs> so <laughs> you, have easy to, you, you have to start with, uh, <laughs> and, and I can, I obviously can see the, the, the reason for the doubt. <laughs> yeah, and the one thing that we, we, we are saying mm. is that probably none of the current MPs and MCAs would qualify to sign this pledge. Mm. Mm. Because it also includes a statement that I have never been involved in anything that would bring question to my integrity. Mm. Uh, and um, <clears throat> and you know they they know it's a bit hard for them to sign it when it comes around to <laughs> <Right>. it. <laughs> they, they, and people are asking, for example, if you listen to a lot of Bungela or Nainchi, uh meetings, mm. I, as I watched one in Limuru East, where Mwanainchi asked the the current MCA at the time when the BBI was was uh, on the table. Yeah. And it was on the table in 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 uh, in, 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 in the counties, mm -hmm. in the county assemblies. Uh, do you agree you are supposed to represent us? Yes. Do you agree you are supposed to take our views? Yes. Uh, Did you do so? Uh, no. Uh, the books were the books were distributed. Uh -huh. uh, Did you receive two million shillings <laughs> so that you could pass the BBI? Uh, yes. Uh -huh. uh, so what did we get as the Wanainchi? It will be very difficult for anybody to believe 
that um, that that the ad of the MCAs mm. who who um, passed or who demanded uh, the, the grant before passing the the <coughs> the BBI mm. um, are going to be people who can sign that pledge and keep it. But the people we are looking at is a completely whole new set of so a new crop of leaders co completely new that will now come in with integrity they'll come in and pledge that i'm going to represent the people yeah. i will live according to the ideals spirit and letter of the constitution and what the people expect of a representative in the national assembly yes. and in the county assembly yeah, in the county and should i not do that i will resign so remember Maybe. we are looking uh. we are looking at uh, supporting about 2,000 candidates. Right. Mm -hmm. The objective being to have at least one candidate in each of the 1,834 1, seats and, and to move for a majority in each of, this, in each of the houses, mm -hmm. the, the, assembly, the, the assemblies, um, national and county. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have a majority, that, and let's say you have 1,000 um, MPs and MCAs countrywide, if 10% of these people refuse to follow the pledge, you still have a large number of people who will still continue the, the, the objective and the, and the cause. Mm. These other 10% we will deal with because what they sign as a pledge will be a contract. It will be a contract with to to Jukute. And, we, and we, we have seen that we are actually able to take that contract mm. to court. Yeah. Uh -huh. we, it, it so will it's be enforceable. A, it, will be a, it will be a nuisance, of course, because you know having yeah. to go to court and all that. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and these people always produce some other section, 22.5 mm. of some other law which nobody knew about <laughs> that produces a technical problem. Mm. But we will take it. And are, these, and are these individuals represented across parties? So obviously they need a vehicle through which they would then uh, sit. So it doesn't matter what party these individuals who've then signed this contract then represent. It doesn't matter? So... Um, on the parties, we spoke about the quality of parties. Mm. And I think we recognize that um, parties are very personal vessels and tools of individuals in politics. Yeah. If you are elected on a political party, you owe your allegiance to that party. And that party can dictate the way you, will operate. you, you operate. Mm. Yes. It is therefore not possible mm. for you to be directly responsible to the people if you are sponsored by a party. Mm. So we are looking at the people who will be Kuwajibika candidates being independent. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's take a break on this note. It's half past eight, Kenya's biggest conversation, live on KTN Home, Spice FM and online. In the room with us this morning is Judy Wango and David Kabeberi, advisors of the Tugutuke movement, which is saying, let citizens now take over the reins and power in terms of exercising the constitution. We have the sovereign power. Can we determine who exactly leads us and represents us in our county assemblies and in the National Assembly? That is the conversation we're having. Keep it right here. We'll be back shortly. The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Brought to you by Colgate. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Hey, it's getting hot in here. The media has greatly contributed to the moral rot that we experience in this country. I remember a senior politician telling me, point blank, nobody steals in the field, it's stolen in the granary. So my friend, if you are going to win an election, Jipange kwa granary. I think we are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Mm. Our violator and abuser <laughs> is also our redeemer in our mind. The whole political class, the whole political institution is rotten. It is based on ideals that cannot progress our country forward. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The group of leaders we are having now, these are just like the polymers. The chemical composition is the same. Are you corruptible? Hopefully not. <laughs> and, and maybe that's part of the problem. 
people who have done about 300 speeches and they are not saying anything. What makes you think that they will come in with something really dramatic? Don't miss out on the latest from Kenya's biggest conversation. All right, uh, sunny conditions in Nairobi this morning. We'll see highs of uh, 26 and lows of 16. At 19, it's cloudy in Nakuru. Highs of 29 and lows of 14. 26 will be the high in a cloudy Nyeri at 16 currently, coming down to lows of uh, 13. 22 and cloudy in Elder at highs of 26 and lows of 15. Light rain in Mombasa at 29, highs of 33 and lows of 26. And we're looking at Malindi Sunny at 29, highs of 33 and lows of 28. Mostly cloudy conditions at 22 in Kisumu. We'll see highs of 31 and lows of 20 and it's mostly cloudy at 21 in Kakamega. 32 will be the high and lows of 16. Sunny in Kampala at 22, highs of 29 and lows of 19 and we'll see highs of 32 and lows of 26 in a uh, sunny Dar es Salaam. All right, we're looking at mostly sunny conditions at 16 in Joburg, 23 will be the high and lows of 10 and it's clear in Lagos at 28 with highs of 34. We'll also see highs of 34 in Kinshasa. It's mostly sunny at 21. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. All right, still in traffic hour, a few minutes after 8.30, and we're seeing that traffic has not been too bad this morning, which is a good thing. A little bit on North Airport, then heading out towards Outer Ring. The Eastern Bypass was really heavy this morning, and it still continues just so. Looking at thicker superhighway, eek, uh, not looking too exciting right now, uh, inbound traffic is bumper to bumper. We're also looking at a bumper to bumper situation on Kiambu Road, a little bit here and there on Limuru Road, and coming into the city, um, that's moving. Right Ozinga Way is packed from the beginning to the end, and the end is the roundabout on Gong Road, and that's moving really slowly. Not too bad uh, traffic on Langata Road. Um, and then on Huru Highway, getting out towards the city is where we see it building up. But it's manageable. Let's keep it just still, shall we? Spice of MKE on Twitter, talk to us there, text 40127. up your life mature intelligent talk every morning spice up yourself it's 25 minutes to nine this is kind of biggest conversation Eric Lassi, Mundu Oko, David Kabeberi and Judy Wango advisors the Tugutuke movement and we're talking about you know getting the youth to get excited and get involved in the next general election from whatever angle from um, activism, from organizing, from mobilizing, from holding leaders accountable, from vetting the candidates that are coming and seeking the votes. And Judy, you said, well, the youth have for a long time felt, you know, like they don't have a role to play in this. Mm -hmm. What is Tukutuka going to do to change that mindset? Because we saw, yes, the youth um, have did not come out in the expected numbers to register mm -hmm. as voters, yes. but still they... The fact is, the majority of the voters that are registered, the 20 million plus, are still youth. Mm. So what, what is it that Tugutuke is going to do to change this mindset of the youth that are registered as voters, and even those that are not registered as voters, to be active between now and August 9th? So uh, right now we are thinking of solutions, and we have, we have already formed an, an assembly, uh, which is on tugutuke.co.ke, where it's an all-round participation, where... You, will, you can go and put your suggestions, your grievances, and what you hope to see in the government. And through the same platform, the Kuwajibika candidates are able to see what is it that the people want. So it's, it, it's a forum or a platform that brings all of us together. Mm. So if we are able to garner the Kuwajibika candidates in the, in the, assemb in the National Assembly, mm then I believe we, we can move forward from that. And you're looking up, so are you just focusing on the National Assembly or are you also including the Senate and the County Assemblies? Those as well, mm -hmm. because they are, you know, like we said, we, we start with the MCAs, the MPs and the Senate. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking at about one, okay, 1,450 wards in the country, 47 mm -hmm. 
senators, 47 women reps, mm-hmm. 290 constituency MPs, yeah. 1,834. Mm. Is that correct, That's Mr. Correct. Accountant? Yes. Yeah, you've just been doing like... <laughs> In my opinion, <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is a very high number. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And like you said, David, it's not looking at a necessarily political party candidates. Mm-hmm. It's independent candidates. Mm-hmm. What's the likelihood? What What is the target number of independent candidates that you hope to get? I'm sure you're working with targets. Our target yeah. is if out of this 1,834, we get uh, 1,000 candidates who sign up onto the Kuajibika pledge, then we have uh, a good stead. We are, ca- we are looking for at least, at least 50%. At least 50%. What is 50% of 1834? Uh, that's very hard to calculate. <laughs> <laughs> 917. But it's 917. Uh, yeah. uh, in my See? opinion, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is uh, 50%, at least 50% win mm. in, uh, in the houses. Okay. So that we have majority mm. in the houses. But in terms of the candidates mm. running, we are looking to have at least 2,000, mm. which means one for each seat. One mm. for each seat. Okay. Um, and if you're looking at... Um, are there independent candidates of that number? In the last election, mm. not last year, in the last year, in, you know, this thing looks like it was the last year. Mm. In 2017? Maybe it's my age. Yes, <laughs> clearly. Uh, out of the 15,000 candidates, 4,000, about 600 were independent. So, so there will, and this, uh, this year I would expect that there will be more independent mm. uh, candidates. So, mm. It won't be a question of whether we will find enough candidates. It will be a question of whether we will find enough candidates who will qualify mm. in terms of the of, of the, the vet and the ability to to engage with the pledge. Okay, I, 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 obviously there's something that's being that's trying. To, there's a solution that's being sought after here. Mm. Something is trying to be solved, mm. and oftentimes I say that if you're trying to solve the problem, you have to look at what caused uh, the problem in the first place. So. Why do you think then that there has not been this participation at the level to which we would like it to be concerning the young people up until this point in time? Mm-hmm. And it's a cross board, whether you want to look at what folks have called apathy mm-hmm. when it comes to registration by youth to vote, mm-hmm. whether it is participation, whether it is putting themselves up for candidacy, whatever it has been. What do you think has caused this problem? I'll leave it for Judy because it's, it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> well, you we feel that we are not represented, we are not involved, mm. and we feel it's about time that we get there. The problem usually, the problem that we f- the the problem is, um, over time, um, these people have not been transparent. They have not been accountable, you know. So we feel, what is the point? You know, mm. it's, it is because of what those people have been doing, the, the political those elite. Those people being the ones who poli- are in, in positions of right leadership now. today. Yes, okay. yeah. Mm-hmm. So w- we feel they're not going to do anything anyway. We've had all those promises before mm-hmm. and they never follow through. So now to Gutuke, it is us sitting down and thinking, now what, how do we make them accountable? Okay. What do we do about it? Many folks then would ask, what is the guarantee that bringing in somebody who is vested, somebody then who has seen these things play out over the last 10 odd so years, mm. now wants to get into the system, mm. which many would argue corrupted the individuals who are those people today. Mm-hmm. What is the guarantee that younger people getting into the same system would not face the same problem? I can help there. Mm. Um, I don't. The Tukutuk is not saying that younger people have to be the leaders, mm. and in fact, not saying younger people are better leaders. We are saying people who agree and pledge to be accountable mm-hmm. um, are the people we need to elect because they are going to represent us. Sure. In fact, um, <clears throat> you know this leadership thing where where suddenly you get elected and you become Mweshimiwa with uh, with the bells and whistles and helicopters escorting you really ought to be a thing of we need to get rid of that and have MPs, MCAs and senators who are muakilishi, real representative. Mm-hmm. So um, it's not so much the, 
bring, trying to bring in new people into mm-hmm. the same old bottle of wine. Right. But uh, make them accountable. And they don't even have to be young. But they need to be accountable mm-hmm. to the majority. Mm-hmm. And that majority of Kenyans is young. Yeah. So once you're accountable to the majority, you're actually being accountable to the young people. And, and when you're accountable to the young people and working for the young people, you will, we will stop seeing what we have done nowadays, seeing the young people as a special interest group. Mm. Yes. I always wonder, how can the majority <laughs> be a special, be a interest, special group. interest group? It's because the special requires interest requires affirmative group, action. Yeah, it is, it is us <laughs> up here at our age, mm. because we, we, we don't have to, to report to them. What we usually do is promise them yes. goodies. Mm. Yes. Yeah, you will get jobs, you will get uh, 6,000 bob, you will mm. get maybe some other stuff like that. But, but we are always promising them, yes, yeah. as special interest. But if this majority of people are the ones calling the shots by having elected people who, they re- who report to them, mm. then suddenly the special interest people become people my age who, who need support to, 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 to survive. Mm. So... The, the and I lost my train of thought as I was speaking. <laughs> the guarantee that yeah. once they are there, they are going to live by the ideals. Yes, because they they are not coming because they are young. Mm. They are coming because they they have made the pledge. Okay. But the other thing we need to sort of keep in mind is that um, running good politics is not just getting right people to do the right thing. This is somebody who quoted this, and I found it a very powerful quote. Mm. It's about getting the wrong people and the right people to do the right thing. Mm. <laughs> and if they don't do the right thing, then there must be punishment mm. for not doing the right thing. There because we can, we can spend it. a long time trying to say who are the right people. Yes. Mm. But it's just getting everybody, everybody to do the right thing. To do the right thing mm. And there be punishment for right. doing the wrong thing. David, the current situation where <clears throat> we know we're talking about those the majority the young people very many people feeling disenfranchised feeling disconnected with the politics feeling let down by leadership feeling let down by government is it an indictment on your generation perhaps those that have been there before those that are that you know the young people are looking up to and they feel we have nothing to look up to is that an indictment on the older generation i I feel it is um and, and, and for us, we would also induct our, our, our older generation mm. because um, I think that in the last 50, 60, 70 years, we haven't dealt with uh, succession of leadership. We haven't dealt with training younger people to, to take over responsibility. In, in the days before colonialism, and I'm not making an excuse here, mm. but we did have cultural uh, systems that ensured there was a deliberate uh, succession. Mm. When when this generation got older, this generation there was ways in which it took over. Mm. Uh, but today um, th- we don't, we haven't done that, and we haven't trained um, our young people generally mm. as, as to be leaders. So now we are getting around creating development leadership development training um, institutes and efforts like that. But they will only target a small number mm. of of that of the population. Mm. Which means, again, we will get to a point where we are dependent on a small number of people. And, and the other people don't understand what the, the leadership uh, requirements are. Mm. So, for sure, and on behalf of, of my, my generation, mm. we, we accept the indictment. And, and the only thing to do now yeah. is to try and correct it. And correct it. And on the matter of accountability <clears throat> and um, you know, leaders being in office and feeling that they ought to represent the people uh, and they're answerable to the people that put them in, in office and doing their job as they ought to be doing their job. What role do you think the professional associations, the professions do play in this, in you know, just taking a back seat? So for instance, you say you're an accountant, you've been in this for many years in accounting, in, in audits. You, you, you have also participated in championing good leadership for many years. Now, if you look back and you see the kind of corruption that we've had, there's always going to be some auditor somewhere who sat back and let these things happen. They are, look at the number of lawyers, of, of accountants, of engineers that we have in the current National Assembly, and we are still pointing fingers and asking ourselves, what are we getting from this National Assembly? So the professional bodies such as ISPAC that you belong to, 
the Law Society of Kenya, the uh, Architectural Association of Kenya, and others, have they let down the rest of the population by not being active? I think by, by looking the other way, even perhaps within their, their own uh, professional um, associations, mm. I haven't studied this very much, but I would say that when in in uh, 2002, Yote uh, Wezekana took over and and we became with we Moi the Moi regime came to an end. There was a huge sense of success mm. amongst Kenyans that okay that Kabad regime has gone, um, so now we are we are in the right place. Mm. A lot of people dropped out. Of the of the fight because we have succeeded, um, <clears throat> and it was a very positive time. And when Kibaki was president, the next ten years, then when uh, eventually we got the the new constitution, which you, if you remember was was the subject um, from 1992, it took to 2010 mm. to actually change the constitution to what we now call the our, our liberation uh, uh, constitution. Mm. Again, there was a sense of success. Mm. And we are done. You know, really, we have done well, and um, now let's go and, and implement the constitution and live a happy life. And a lot of the people who are playing watch stopped watching. Mm -hmm. In fact, the, the, a lot of the civil, civil society, which was very strong in, in the 20 years before, uh, moved on to doing uh, other civil society activities. And, and now we find ourselves where we are because we actually um, didn't keep an adequate watch on what happened in the implementation of that constitution. Right. We actually left the employees, the people who were employed by the constitution, to implement it. Mm. And of course, they implemented it as best as they thought for themselves. Mm. That is a natural thing. <laughs> so one of the things that we would have to do, and when we're looking at Tugutuke, is not just at the elections in 2022. Mm. We are looking at reforms in the constitution mm -hmm and implementation of the constitution and also bring it about culture and change we have to actually bring people around mm. to think uh, positively to come to come out of thinking that you have to be corrupt to survive True. do you think that there's enough engagement or involvement with the electoral process or even with uh, education about government and how leadership works and then to say that maybe some of the problems that we see uh, later on is because there was not intimate knowledge or, you know, activation with the system and how it works. And our colleague CT often says that perhaps as young as primary school is when we need to start to inculcate some of these things. Because we see other countries, other uh, societies whereby there's no question you're involved in the process, you're making demands of the the the, the the smallest unit of governance in your area, they know who you are, you know who they are, and that's because it was ingrained in you from a very um, a basic point. Do you think that it would make a difference if that happened? If at primary school levels, for example, you know who your ward representative is, you know what they ought to be doing, you have a genuine understanding of how processes work, do you think then it would make it easier then for you to then be involved in the process later on in life or at least then be able to make demands of those people who are in leadership, leadership positions? Yeah, I think that would be the ideal situation. Like um, the civic education ought to be, to be introduced early. Mm. Yeah. What about you, David? Mm. Yeah. <clears throat> well, you know, you're right. And it, it, it will make a difference. Um, if you think about... Today, um, where do we teach values? Mm. Um, and I think there's nowhere. Mm. Uh, it's not in school. In school, you have to pass chemistry and all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, it's not at home. Uh, not at home because, you know, most of the times we are not there. And actually, most of the time, the guys who are at home at the age 25 are on, on, the, on the phone. They're mm. bo born with the phone in the hand. Mm. Um, there's religion because a lot of people go to, go to church. But that spiritual is not necessarily values of who am I and, and, and who am I to, mm. to the community. Mm -hmm. So, and if you, are, if you recognize that, that the, there's people who have captured the political system, the less people know, the happier we will be. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so even in a, at a time of campaign, the people campaigning mm. promise everything other than what they're supposed to do because yeah. it's easier to say, I'll build a road. It's easier to say, I brought a school mm. um, <clears throat> and to actually use our money called CDF to, to do that. Yeah. So the people listening then understand that the job of the MP mm -hmm. is to bring the CDF to build a to school. build a school. a school, and and from the young people, that even as young as as ten years old, they understand this, mm. um, they, and they also live. They see the corruption and the, and the bad practice around. Somebody was telling me he met an eleven-year-old boy, mm. and at that time, <coughs> people are sort of thinking, "What do I want to be when I grow up?" Yeah, most people want to be doctors or neurosurgeons or pilot. That is Mutula Kilonzo. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> but this young boy. Uh, wanted to be a policeman. Uh -huh. And he specifically wants to be a traffic policeman. And he explained that he already knows half the job because he knows how much to demand for each offense. <laughs> he knows that a smooth tire is 4,000 shillings. <laughs> he, he actually, that's what he knows, that a traffic policeman's job is to, collect, to collect money, money. For, from people for who offenses. have made offenses. Mm -hmm. Now, you imagine that um, how many of do we have at that age? <laughs> you know, be, be below fifteen. It's fifteen million. It is one third of uh, of our population mm. thinking um, <coughs> like that. Yeah. Um, so yes, early training, early teaching uh, in values and and the values and relationship with one another. Uh, how do we live with with the neighbor? What what is what is my community? You know, because you start with your family as in closest community. Then you have the community that you live with. Mm. Mm. And then you have the bigger community, which is the country. And I hope that one day we can also be calling Africa our, our greater community as Africans. Mm. Mm. Um, we need to do that teaching, and, and it needs to start from very early. Sure. I'm sure we'll all agree that there is need for, even as we're talking about vetting the candidates now, there's a need to holding them accountable post-election. Mm. Mm. And... As the candidates are signing all these pledges, the Kwajibika pledge, who is signing a pledge to keep them, to hold them accountable beyond the election? Because I feel that there ought to be another pledge that as you're signing this pledge that you're going to do A, B, C, D, I'm also signing another pledge that I am going to make sure that I'm active, that I'm uh, looking, I'm, I'm, I am holding you accountable to the pledges that you've made. So... The word kuwajibika mm. is very interesting. Kuwajibika is accountability. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but wajibu mm. is responsibility. So we are saying there are two people involved here. There is the, the, the MP or the MC, the representative, mm -hmm. who must be accountable. But the people also have wajibu of holding the candidates or the MPs accountable. Mm. And uh, what what uh, Tugutuke will do is create the, the administration that will enable the people to to hold their MP accountable. So Tugutuke will create the monitoring and performance monitoring system. Mm. Um, we have designed, but not yet been able to create the civic technology that will enable this to happen uh, on online, mm. so that it does not have to be physical meetings. Mm -hmm so that the pledge for a start will be signed publicly and also be available publicly to the, to the public to see all the time, mm. uh, whether it is the constituents or all Kenyans. Mm. For meetings um, between the MP and, and the residents or, or the constituents to be either f physical or also um, virtual. Mm. Uh, you know, COVID taught us that we can do a lot of things virtually. Mm. Yes. So that we will have an office, a secretariat, that is helping the people monitor, mm. that is asking the MP what happened to your meeting uh, that it was due to, to be in, in March. Yep. Uh, when are you having it? Mm. And, and if, if um, you find that the MP is trailing uh, on, on, uh, <coughs> on their performance mm. and it is vis vis uh, publicly visible mm. because it's on the, on the platform, then uh, the, the Tukutuke begins the process mm. of, of getting the resignation. But the more important person here, really, is the citizen. Mm -hmm. Because we have to take the, the responsibility. And uh, you know, earlier you had asked whether, whether the young people are, uh, are really interested. Mm. 
Uh, and in my view, they, they absolutely are. It's just that they haven't the means by which to, to express the, the, their interests. Right. They are very concerned about corruption. Mm. And first of all, corruption cre uh, assumes something which the younger population completely don't seem to live with, which is hierarchy. You know, mm. young guys don't recognize this is my senior If I want to talk to Trump, I'll tweet him and he'll tweet back. Exactly. <laughs> if, if I'm annoyed with Uhuru, I'll tweet him, although nowadays he doesn't tweet back. Yeah. But uh, so why this system? And so who are you in, in this life to demand that because you are something, some job, I should give you money? Mm. That asks the, the, the younger population mm. more than we, we, we imagine. Um, but it's the question of how do, do they deal with it? What's the opportunity? How, what's the method by which mm. we can deal with it? When we started talking with, the, with the, this group of the Tugutuke, um, it is they who have driven it. And, and they are not, I, I don't think I have seen any of them in a political rally yet. <laughs> <laughs> so they, 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 once you see that there's, there's a thing that you can do, mm. I believe you I participate. Believe they'll, they'll if participate. a platform is provided, yeah. they participate. Yeah. We thank you very much, Judy and David, for joining us today, for uh, telling us about this movement. How can one join the movement quickly in 10 seconds? Tugutuke.com. That's it. Yeah. And the, and, the, and the movement is not necessarily a, a physical meeting of everybody. Mm. Mm. If you believe in, the, in, in, the, in what Tugutuke is saying, spread the word. Mm. Tugutuke.com. Yeah. Mm. David Kabeberi and Judy Wango are advisors of the Tugutuke movement and saying it's about time that citizens take the reins of leadership. Thank you very much. Keep it right here for more conversations. It's now 9 a.m. Spice up your life. The latest news from around the world. 94.4 Spice FM. This is Mizuham Dennis Aseto. With only four months to the August 9th general election, the Independent Election Boundaries Commission, IEBC, has issued a route of timelines for parties, candidates and the presidential polls. The Electoral Board, whose chairperson of Fulaji Bukhani says candidates contesting independently are required to present the IEBC with a clearance certificate from the Office of the Registrar of Political Parties, confirming that one is not a member of any registered political party by May 2nd. They are also required to service the Commission with symbols they intend to use in the election by the same day. And the Independent Election Boundaries Commission says it will appeal the ruling by the High Court that stripped its Electoral Code Enforcement Committee of powers to summon any witness or candidate found to be in violation of the Electoral Code of Conduct. IEBC Commissioner Irene Jesrops Masit says the Commission did not act in vain when it summoned Muranga County Woman Representative Sabina Shege of her claims of rigging in the 2017 general election. Irene Masit told KBC TV that the Commission welcomes the High Court decision, exonerating Muranga MP Sabina Shege and was still standing the judgment. Cancer management in the country has received a major boost with the launch of the Electors Vasa HD, an advanced linear accelerator designed to treat a broad spectrum of cancers and significantly enhance patient care. Vasa HD, the first in the sub Saharan region of Africa, was received by Ministry of Health Chief Administrative Secretary Dr. Masimongangi. The CAS said the Elector. Vasa HD will help improve the quality of life of oncology patients and rationalize treatment cost of tumor diseases in the region. Naro Court has fined two men 50,000 shillings or some 11 months imprisonment each for illegally felling indigenous side trees in the Sanangori area of Mao Forest in Naro County. Douglas Moroto and Amos Kiplangat, who appeared before Naro Chief Magistrate Samuel Mungai, pleaded guilty to the charges of cutting forest produce in government forest contrary to the Forest Conservation and Management Act. The duo was arrested by forest protection officers while in possession of 11 seed trees which they carved out after cutting down the trees without any authorization license or permit james combine an officer from the kenya forest service informed the court that the area affected is an important water tower and therefore the court should apply a stiff penalty to the offenders to discourage others 
And the Kenya Power has decried the increased cases of transformer vandalism in various parts of the country. The company said criminals have resorted to sabotage of efforts to restore supply by emergency teams as they remove fuses from the newly replaced transformers in a bid to increase frustration on customers so that they can yield to their demands. They then solicit money from customers in order to restore supply illegally. Kenya Power Business Manager Engineer Harrison Kamau is calling on you to report power outage or suspected cases of vandalism by dialing star 977 hash. Data from the company indicates that 16% of illegal connections and 9% of deliberate acts including vandalism are among the leading causes of electrocutions. Now, the East African Community Secretariat, in collaboration with other partners, is set to commemorate the 28th anniversary of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda tomorrow at the EAC headquarters in Arusha, Tanzania. The commemoration will be done in conjunction with the Tanzanian local authorities in Arusha, the Arusha and Moshi Rwandan community, the Embassy of Rwanda in Tanzania, the International Residual Mechanism for Criminal Tribunals, the Pan-African Human Rights Court, the Religious Denomination based in Arusha, the representatives of students from high schools and universities of the Arusha region and EAC staff. It is themed, Remember, Unite, Renew. This year's commemoration is once again an occasion to pay tribute to the more than one million innocent lives lost through the heinous extermination of Tutsis in Rwanda 28 years ago. And two human rights groups have accused armed forces from Ethiopia's Amhara region of waging a campaign of ethnic cleansing against Tigrayans. In a joint report, Amnesty International and Human Rights Watch accused Amhara officials and regional special forces and militias fighting in western Tigray of committing war crimes and crimes against humanity. They also accused Ethiopia's military of complicity in those acts. And NATO foreign ministers will gather in Brussels for two days of talks on how to best support Ukraine in the next phase of conflict. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg has said the alliance expects that Moscow will try to capture the entire Donbass region in the east with the aim of creating a land corridor from Russia to annex Crimea. But he continues to insist that no NATO troops or planes will be sent to fight in Ukraine. This is Newswire. I'm Denis Sassetto. Good morning. A few minutes past nine o'clock and what are we looking at? Uh, traffic still continues on Uhuru Highway getting out into the city. Uh, it's not been too bad today. Three hurrahs for traffic on these Nairobi streets. Uh, we're looking at Jogo Road, which is your normal thing, you know, but it hasn't been anything back-breaking. Um, right out Dingaway is moving slowly, going towards Gong Road. Uh, apart from that, we haven't seen anything major that's destabilizing anybody. The thicker superhighway has been heavy. Uh, it still continues just so past survey and then into the city, but then Murat Road is looking very good, as is um, Rangari Mavaiwe connecting from the Muru Road. Easy streets. Let's take a look at about half an hour and see if that has changed or, you know, died down completely. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Let us know. Uh, text 40127. This is the Situation Room. The home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room. The only Yay, way to start seven your Seven minutes day. after nine. Good morning. This is the final hour of the show today. We hope you're having a wonderful Wednesday morning, wherever you're tuned in around the globe. Kenya's biggest conversation. CT is away until Monday. So we've said that a number of times now. Pakahimi is like, eh, you people. See, relax. Allow Sheesh. me to enjoy my allow me to enjoy myself. <laughs> what is it? <laughs>
hey, every little moment I have, <laughs> na enjoyment. <laughs> hey, today's proverb is from Malawi. When you are crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself get bitten by the little fish. When you're crossing over a river, you might be eaten by crocodiles, but don't let yourself get bitten by this little fish. And I think David just gave us the apt, most apt mm. translation of this. Don't overlook the pennies. Make sure you watch out for the little fish. If those don't bite you, even a crocodile will not bite you. Ah, oh, voila. Mm. Or if they do. A crocodile also will. Oh, if the small <laughs> fish bite you, it means that you just be, you're crossing this river carelessly. Anyhow. Yeah. Fua. And that is wrong. Do not. There's a big crocodile that's about to bite us anyway. And this is <laughs> so tomorrow in Parliament. Okuri Atanu will be in Parliament tomorrow and he'll be presenting the 2022-2023 financial year's budget. He hopes that the... He hopes that he'll be the, the finance minister even in the next administration <laughs> <laughs> and that he will be spending 3.3 trillion shillings to finance government operations for the next one year. 3.3 trillion shillings. Current budget, we are, coming, we are closing it at, um, what? It's not 3.6. There was 3.6 and then there's an extra how many hundred billions that were added. So yeah, I think we've clo come close to 3.7 trillion shillings being spent in this financial year. Now, if you look at all the priority projects, the CS has said we are still going to focus on Big Four. Some enablers and drivers of the Big Four agenda. Um, there's also completion of projects that have started. There's a lot that's been going on. But then the lawmakers will have a difficult task here mm. looking at, so how do we finance three trillion shillings? How do we repay the debts that we have? How do we collect collect more taxes from people? What do we need to levy to this already dead horse? What do we do? Do we cut off the hooves and go sell them because maybe someone may have some need for the horse? The horse is dead. Mm. Okay. How can we still milk something out of it? There's nothing left. But the thing is, in the spending of this money, it's still going into this this, what we've seen in the last four years is likely what we're going to see in this budget in terms of what they consider the priority areas in that of going to spend. What should the money be going to? Hmm. Those are the questions we're asking ourselves today. When XN Iraqi, the professor, was in the studio with us, he was telling us, okay, so there's a lot of um, stuff being done, but are we focusing on the right things? What, do you, what is the right thing? If this was your budget, Ndu, mm -hmm. okay, and you're looking at the current situation, the current state of affairs. What would you want to spend the money on now? Well, I mean, look, uh, you, you've, you're being given a budget. If it was me, you're giving, being given a budget where some things are already going wrong, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there are certain things which have to be taken care of. You have your recurrent expenditure, which, of course, you say, OK, look, in order to keep the lights on and in order to keep the water flowing, there are some things that we must do. Mm -hmm. And I would say, yes, recurrent expenditure, which is often the biggest part of any budget, needs to be taken care of. Yeah. Let's do that. Yeah. I would put a halt on new projects completely. It needs to stop now. I would pay special attention to the things that are clearly calling out for help today. Mm -hmm. Health is one of them. Because, I mean, here it's very clear. You cannot operate when you have a sick nation. Yeah. And you have people who cannot seek health care because of one, two, three other things. I would fix that. Uh, I would feed the nation. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean just giving food to uh, the, the people who need it, mm. but also making sure that your sources of food are protected and that there's a guarantee for sustainable food sources moving forward. Mm -hmm. I would do those three things mm -hmm. so that you can catch up. Because what you need to do right now is catch up. You cannot be in a deficit, number one. And at the same time, you're trying to be all nice and shiny out here. And there are things that are eating into what you would ordinarily use to remain stable. Mm. So I wouldn't go into anything new. And I would not put money into things where you can see there have not been good results. I mean, it's shown you. It's, you don't have to look so very far. So what, what, what would you say is an area that you cannot see good results? 
Name one where you say, you see, they spent money here. They should stop. Not, not necessarily stop. Put a hold. Put a halt to it. This uh, housing, manufacturing, we've not been able to get mm. ducks in a row in order to roll it out properly. Mm -hmm. Anybody can see that. Hold on to it for now. You know, I know that ha how many have we been able, how many has the go has government been able to... How many housing to, units? Yeah, to complete vis-a-vis mm -hmm. -vis the slated number. If you, if you put a halt to it, you are talking about then um, flouting contracts that have already been signed. I would, I would, that's what, what would I'm saying. What would be the cost of that? I would say finish what is already on ground. Don't start anything new because already in that list, if you look at that project yeah. and I noted it down, that there are some which have not begun mm. and they're saying, OK, we're going to start on them. We're just finalizing the contracts and we move forward. Mm. I would say hold on to those ones. The ones that are mid uh, mid uh, process right now, finish them. But don't take it on anything new. It mm. cannot happen. We're looking at manufacturing of certain things which you're saying, let's get these contracts into place and then we're going to pump in um, some revenue to say that let us start. Can we do it without having streamlined certain processes? The answer is no. Don't put any money into it until you're absolutely sure of what needs to happen. Because this is the problem. We end up having white elephant projects because we've not done the due diligence in the beginning. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't put anything into anything new right now. Because you have a situation that could very easily hurtle into a crisis, spiral into a crisis, if you don't take care of the threads that are already fraying. Okay. I Heal think... your nation, feed your nation, stop taking on new projects. Put, a, put something towards your debts. Cool, man. I agree with you on in in terms of um, I think a lot of effort should be put now. If Uhuru wants to, well, this is not his budget. He's not going to touch this budget even. The next year, it should be about looking at how can we actualize food security. Mm. Now, unfortunately, these two are items that are not a national government agenda. You require the cooperation of the counties. Indeed. Health is a devolved function. And even if you come in as the president and you say, you know, our agenda shall going forward be about health. If the county governments do not hire the staff, if the county governments are not ordering the medicine, if the county governments are not increasing the number of level twos and threes and fours facilities in the country, you are still having a conversation. You have to spend a lot of time trying to convince them. Mm. But there's something that ought to be done on that. Food security as well, it's agriculture, it's devolved. So you at the national level as a government, you're saying, all right, so our focus should be on food security. We are implementing the agriculture sector transformation and growth strategy, blah, 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 blah. But the implementer of this is county government. So how do you get the counties, all 47, plus the one national government, all 48, executives sitting together and saying move this way in the next one year because at national level you are Kuri attorney yes you're coming here you're saying our focus should be but this is the thing eric mm -hmm. that you know unfortunately when we look at the budget there is the assumption that the budget somebody burned the midnight oil mm -hmm. on wednesday night mm -hmm. uh into th in and then voila thursday morning we have a budget it's a process mm -hmm. Over months, folks have been sitting down and saying, let's do this, let's do this. And I would say that today, unfortunately, it's too late to have this huddle. To have everybody streamlined and aligned into this one way of thinking, it is too late. That there has passed a time already mm. when this uh, rallying call should have taken place. But unfortunately, things had already started to go south. It is at that time where you would have said, okay, guys, where are we going with this? In the next few months, we are going to have a, uh, we, we actually right now working on a budget. That you would be working on the budget process. And you cannot hear that alarm bell going off saying that this is wrong. Are we not able to regroup things? That is when you should have been able to say, guys, can we all align on this thing? Because there is not anybody living, breathing human being in this country at the moment who does not see or feel the pressure of what's going on with the economy. Nobody can say they don't. Okay. So if we say that the next financial year's budget, because I'd actually also noted down that those are my two issues. Mm. I'd like the next budget to focus on financing healthcare, mm. focus on financing food security. Right. But then it hit me, I was hit with that realization that, okay, 
even as we say at focus on financing this and the other if at the national level you say you are dedicating a lot of money onto agriculture your role is not implementing you are not going to hire agricultural extension officers no. you're not going to so you can do a, lot, a couple of things you can ensure that there is you know sinking of boreholes supporting the national irrigation board blah 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 this and the other so we have we have the irrigation projects across the country working but the counties have a role in implementation of agriculture if you're in uh, West Pokot County and Elgeo Marakwet and you have the Kerio Valley Development Authority which is a national government function and the Kerio Valley Development Authority has this irrigation schemes that it's running in that area but the counties the new governors are not aligned mm. to your idea that's why I, I took a, a pause and asked myself so how exactly um, should this work but i still think that our focus as a country both at national and county levels should be first of all to ensure that we have a working proper universal health coverage working should have a proper implementation of the national strategies on food security we have a national food uh, and nutrition security strategy we have the agricultural sector transformation strategy we should be an implementing this we should be making sure that everybody can you know every small holder farmer in the country is getting all the support that they want is getting all the support they they need and they're able to implement this so we can grow more food we can have better access to markets the food can be accessible to everybody then you take a breath and then you take a breath and ask yourself <laughs> so we are asking 48 people to make sure that this happens but this is what i'm saying that everybody can see you think that you're living in a vacuum where you sit and you say that the pressures of the economy that you feel them you're mm. not the only one everybody mm. can even those who are sitting in those hoity toity high and lofty positions they can see it and they feel it as well mm. now this is where we're saying uh, we've heard people who are gurus in uh, the econ in the economy and they say we are looking for a robust budget making process this is it. Mm -hmm. Vibrant, robust means having the audacity to say, let us not do things in the manner in which we used to do them. Because you can see the situation that in which it currently is, it's not good. Mm. So can you then veer off a little bit in order to get back on the, on the right path? Mm. Absolutely, you can. Then... That's just what needs to happen. Like I said, well, it's a, it's a little bit too late in the game right now because the process required that you do that from that point. Is budget <laughs> making political? Absolutely it is. it is. But do you want to save the country? You do. You do. Abu Said says, spot on do, the government should stop further spending and prioritize the important sectors of the economy. People must be fired who have already failed this economy. I mean... Even the blind can attest to what's happening. Yeah. And I'd like to ask you, do you agree with Ndu? Do you agree with Abu? Do you agree with what we're saying? 0719012600. So Okuri Tan is going to parliament tomorrow. He's going to spend money. But we're asking, okay, yes, yes, yes. He's already presented his budget estimates. He's already presented his uh, what he wants to spend the money on. Parliament has already looked and said, yeah, yeah, we agree this should be spent this way. But what should the priority areas be? What should Kenya spend money on today? Hmm. In the next one year, what should Kenya spend its money on? That's the question you're asking. 0719-012600. Call in and let's have this conversation with you. Very many, I mean, so we have big four for sure. Mm -hmm. It's going to, it's, it's have, already there. We've got to find a way of, of supporting people into enterprise. So whether it's enterprise in agriculture, whether it's enterprise in whatever other sector, we have got to find ways of supporting people in enterprise. People are getting into, uh, um, uh, you know, ways of of making money, whether they're in business, whether they're farming, whether whatever they're doing, those people need support. What is a big, one of the greatest hindrances to a business today is access to finance. Mm -hmm. So we know the Stawi Fund was established, but the Stawi Fund only those guys in the national treasury know about it mm. and the guys in the banks they know about it nobody has been told that this is there's a stawi fund and you can come and access money at a lower interest rate 
Nobody has been, well, people have been told, but <laughs> how many have it's been told? It's not public knowledge. Yeah. Right. It's public, but not public. Mm. Supporting of SMEs is important. Look, look it, it's no secret, right, that the only way that you're going to be able to have uh, an economy moving mm. is when you have more production, right? Mm. But the fundamental question has to be asked. How do we have more production? How do we get industries up and moving and running mm. if the very basics have not been taken care of? It's not possible to do. Mm. So, and look, you, don't, you want to run away from the notion that everybody is uh, crippled and at a point where they cannot move. But this is what we're saying, that we're fast hurtling in that direction. So can you make sure that the basic, the fundamentals have been, have been looked after? Mm. That you will not say that we are going to uh, create then av better avenues for business, better avenues for manufacturing. Who is going to run them? The people who are looking for food on a daily basis? Mm. The people then who cannot afford life? We know it is not the job of government to give you jobs. We are saying... It is the job to create an enabling and sustainable environment within which these things can happen. Can happen. If that's not happening, that's a problem. Private sector needs the support. Karanja in Naivasha, good morning. Good morning, Eric. And uh, do Good morning. Yes, now, mm -hmm. let me say this. You remember the, the, the government of Mwai Kibaki? Yes. Mm. Was saying mm. they needed to bring business uh, services closer to the people, isn't it? Yes. There was a guy who was interviewed uh, in the morning. Mm. You were talking about the extension of research in the agriculture sector, isn't it? Mm. How comes that when you brought, if you, for instance, I'm a student, mm. and I'm sitting for from force, mm. why, how comes that I go there and I'm told the mathematics, maybe you get or Kiswahili is compulsory. Yeah. Why don't we change that scenario and say that agriculture should be compulsory so that we can create what we can do for the Kenyans tomorrow? So you create interest in agriculture? Yes. Okay. Now, coming to the point, mm -hmm. Eric. Mm -hmm. One thing is this. I have said this for a very long time. Yeah. See, these CS for finance has, was appointed. Mm. We had been losing. <laughs> look, look, my friend. Uh -huh. What was what conspired yesterday in the National Assembly in the Senate? Uh -huh. These people, in order for them to create a solution, they were escalating some problems. Mm. These people they were creating problems in front of the problems. So <laughs> look at the fraud crisis, for instance, Eric. Eh? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As uh, uh, those small cartels, or three people or ten people, they have created what we call the artificial strategies. You see, mm. the government should think of how to do. Mm. In, in fact, look, if I could be the, 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 the CS for finance today, mm. yesterday, tomorrow, it will be the budget today. Yeah. What the minister, I could ask the minister to do is to look for the high cost of living. Do, do you even look at the, the cost of hunger? So the cost of cooking oil? Where, yeah, yes. Where yes, where yes. where should the money be spent? I think the money mm. they should release the money what we call the to pay what we call the, the what do we what do you call this? They, they, they pay this money for the people, maybe for the counties, those people the people should they should pump money for the counties. Okay. So that the country should pay the pending bills, mm. okay, the pending bills, so that more people can have that money and the money can circulate throughout the country. Thank you very much. Asante sana, Karanja. 0719-012-600. Okuri Tanu will be in Parliament tomorrow. He will be presenting the next financial year's budget. Well, it's coming in early here because elections and all. But what should the government prioritize its spending on? in the next financial year, 2022, 2023. What is it that should be our priority spending areas? Take a household, for example, mm. somebody who then was in the doldrums financially and then was then given a lifeline, a shot in the arm to kind of get back uh, into things. Mm. Think about it at that granular level and then try to extrapolate onto a national level now dealing with a country. What would you focus your attention on?
You want to make sure that the folks who are in the household, right, mm. are healthy. They've eaten something on a daily basis while you then now try to get back on track. Is there somebody in that house, in that household of the adults, then one person that you can send out to be doing some work? Can they go do that work if they're not healthy or have not fed on a daily basis? No. You want to make sure there's some food in the house that says some sustenance upon which people can run. All right. Then you want to say, OK, we are, we're feeding people. We still have something left. At least we have something that's coming in. Do we have some debt? Can we can we start to pay that off so, a little so, bit here so, and there? So when you say... Then can we now start building towards bringing in some more income? When you say that you, the first thing that you want to do is make sure that there's food in the house, what exactly are you saying? Are you saying that you you should spend the money that you have to buy the food for today? No. How do you make sure that there's food in the house as a first priority? See, so, you no, know, you have somebody who you you, really, you have some income coming. You have something coming. You're not you're not completely cash strapped. You've got it's it's um, a one year it's one year financial budget. Mm. Let's break it down into a one week. So you have this money to spend this week. You're not buying food every day. So you put something in the pantry. So you go and buy food. Put something in the pantry. While you have your sustainable source that's still bringing in something for you. But you have, I have not had you telling me where you're putting the money for the sustainable source. What do you mean where you're putting it? Yes. So I've given you 3,000 shillings. Mm -hmm. This is the, all the money that you have this week. Budget cycle is a week. Mm -hmm. Okay? Divide that money. So if you say that you're buying food... And it's, it's a priority, yes. So you want to feed the family, so you go and buy food, okay? Mm. Uh-huh. As you're getting more in, because remember, there's still money coming in. No, there's no money coming in. You're also, what I'm telling you, there is money coming the, in. There is one person who is working. The there is money coming the in. The budget is for this week, mm -hmm. and the money is coming in, has come in. It's a three it's a 3,000 shillings. There will still Next week is a new, new, new financial week, new financial budget. Yeah, but you you definitely put some food. You put some food, some money aside for food. You have to eat. You have to eat. You can't have half the people eating and then half the other people in the okay. house. So if we take this into sustained. a country, yeah. it's a one-year financial uh, financial budget. Mm. All right. So three trillion shillings. When we say that, let's make sure that people are eating. What exactly are we saying? Are we saying that we are giving them food? No, we are saying that we are protecting or at least establishing and then protecting your sources of food. It should not be, it should not be that you have people who are crying, they're hungry. We understand that there's a drought, but protect your, the sources of food that you have. What are you putting in implementing to make sure that at least all year round you have adequate food sources for the nation? Yes. So coming back into that other example, so it's basically saying that invest in a kiosk where you're selling burgers every day so then the or, returns or plant that something award. in your backyard so that after some time you start to realize and then it starts to then you can sustain on that okay so you're investing in some in some income generating activity activity uh -huh. so if we say that we're investing investing into those income generating activities that's why the government will come and tell you that's why we're putting up money for infrastructure so that you know this infrastructure is an enabler that's why we're putting in money but, into but you see the into, problem is that they have uh, been putting it up every year for the last four years it's, and it's been enabling no and you have not been able to then see the results of it. This is where we started from in the first place. That you've been putting money here and they say we've not been able to see it. So, okay, can we then streamline those things? Can we streamline them or stop them completely? Those, pe those who came out and put an end, and of course the example is Kibaki, and put a halt on some of these projects, they didn't do it because they didn't have anything else to do. They saw, okay, hold on a minute. Are there some things that we can complete? Is there borrowing that me it does it have to happen or can we run on what we currently have? Mm -hmm. And so the results. thinking was halt, let's audit, let's reprioritize. Let's see what we have and let's see what it can do for us. Do we have to uh, uh, tighten the belt a little bit here and there? Absolutely. Do it. Can we reduce recurrent ex expenditure? Are there some things that money is being spent on which are absolutely unnecessary? Do it. Do the hard work of doing that audit mm. and then streamline some of these things. Mm. There is nothing and wrong with having a reformist priorities. budget. They created priorities. In the end of Kibaki's era, I'll have you know that there were many unfinished projects. Indeed. 
that he inherited and left unfinished. Because he reprioritized and thought, okay, yeah, now nah, those are not a priority. We still have some unfinished projects. Some of those 11 trillion shillings worth of unfinished projects we talk about started in the Moy era. Mm. 27 minutes to 10, Kenya's biggest conversation. Let's take a break. We want to hear from you as well. 0719-012-600. What should this budget finance? The Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation. Brought to you by Colgate. Mm -hmm. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The only way to live your best life is to create a balance between work, love, and play. Smoking shish and releasing things on your smoke like a smoke. <laughs> right. You understand what I'm saying? Yes. And you want God to give you a man who has a mission and a vision. You may create an illusion of because he's younger, he's interested in me or he likes me, but he's using me. Text the word ADULT to 22840 to get the latest clips from adults in the room directly to your mobile phone. SMS ADULTS to 22840. The adults in the room. Classic soul, R&B, smooth jazz, neo soul, and nostalgic ballads. Make some noise. Yeah. You're listening to Spice FM. The Board of Governors, Principal, and the entire staff of PC Kenyanjui Technical Training Institute wish to invite all graduates who qualify for the award of Artisan, Craft, and Diploma Certificate during 2018 to 2021 academic years to the Institute's sixth graduation ceremony. The ceremony will be held on Friday, 8th April 2022 from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. at the Institute's grounds. The chief guest will be Dr. Margaret W. Mwakima, Principal Secretary. State uh, the sun is up in Nairobi. We'll see highs of 26 and lows of 16 today. It's mostly cloudy at 20. Five today in Nakuru, highs of 29 and lows of 14. Light rain in Yeri at 21, highs of 26 and lows of 13. While Eldoret is sunny at 24, it'll go to highs of 26 and lows of 15. It's raining in some parts of Mombasa at 30, highs of 33 and lows of 26. While Malindi is sunny at 30, we'll see highs of 33 and lows of 28. Dar es Salaam raining as well at 29, go to highs of 32. While uh, in Lagos, mostly cloudy at 27 with highs of 34. Johannesburg is sunny at 19, highs of 23 today, while Kinshasa is sunny at 22, going to highs of 34. All right, out in Beijing, it's sunny going into uh, Wednesday afternoon. 14 will be the high and lows of 2, while Paris is cloudy at 9, highs of 14. London is cloudy at 11 with highs of 13. And we're all things out in uh, rainy New York at 8 degrees. We'll see highs of 11. Spice up your life. Much better at a few minutes after 9.30. Traffic hour ended early today. We're not seeing too much on those roads. It's looking a lot better. Who knows what it will look like after the 9th of April when the expressway will be up and running and folks can use that option. We'll just have to wait and see. For now, Uhuru Highway is where you get the most action as well as the Thicker Soup Highway. But it's dying down as you get into the city. And we're looking at back-to-back -back traffic on Limuru Road. That's moving really slowly. Apart from that, folks not having too bad of a time, except on Juja Road where there's some business I don't understand getting into the city. But but uh, that should clear up in no time. Okay. Talk to us through the morning. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Text 40127. Business news on Spice FM. Good morning. This is Spice Business. I am Stephanie Wangari. The state will find fuel marketers accused of hoarding petrol and diesel. Petrol Principal Secretary Andrew Kamau said the investigations into the shortage were being finalized, setting the stage for financial penalties and license withdrawals. He added that the supply hitches that caused the nationwide fuel shortage are expected to ease from Thursday after oil marketers steeped supplies to stations from depots. 
Now, textbook firms have warned of price increases following a surge in freight charges in the international market. The firms, which import printing paper from paper mills in Europe, China, Asia and Australia, say it now costs 920,800 shillings to bring in a container up from 172,650 shillings in CAD pre-COVID-19 period. Kenya Publishers Association, which represents 99% of local publishers, says the increase cost of freight will have a bearing on their profit margins. Resolution Insurance Company Limited has been placed under statutory management by the Commissioner of Insurance for a period of 12 months. The Commissioner of Insurance Limited has appointed the policyholders' compensation fund as the statutory manager. The insurance regulatory authority say the company has been facing a number of challenges, particularly relating to its ability to meet its obligations and mitigate its inherent risks. That's your business news. I am Stephanie Wangari. Business news, keeping you up to date on all your money matters. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings, done 22 right. minutes, 22. 94.4. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, budget is coming tomorrow. <laughs> And we are talking about the areas that uh, this budget, what is it that we want uh, this budget to focus on? 0719012600, just call in so we can have this conversation with you. Andrew says, with all due respect, tomorrow's budget will make mention of significant expenditures on all manner of national security issues. Will there be any discussion of how much such money will be spent to resolve or counter existential threats from Al-Shabaab, the so-called armed bandits? Etc. Etc. Andrew, you can be sure that still the biggest chunk of our budget will not be going to health. It mm-hmm. will be going to security. We also know the biggest chunk actually of our budget is uh, going to education as well. So security is still getting it. The question is, of the money that goes to security, how much is actually dealing with the threats from Al Shabaab? How much is dealing with insecurity within the country? We have issues of. Kitui and Tanariva. There's a story today about Kitui and Tanariva, the border between Kitui and Tanariva County. There have been skirmishes. People mm. are abducted. People are killed. Farmers. We have, of course, all these other issues in the north. How much are we dealing with that? Zachary. Oh, good morning. Good morning, people. Good, good morning. morning, Zachary. I'm okay. I'm okay. Probably you. I don't know. I'm, we are missing Marimuandro. Where is he? Marimua, we do not know where he is. <laughs> He's oh, under the rock. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but I hope he is doing well, wherever yes. he is. Yes. Uh, let him know that he should be back immediately. Kabisa, let the man rest, yes. Buana. Paguka there, and we are. He is our institutional memory now. The, 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 on the issue, yeah. um, well, uh, Mr. Eric, I don't know what I'm going to say because these people there, the panel. Mm. You are interacting with the people. Mm-hmm. And we are saying that uh, Mr. Huru has done this so much, in fact, which is good, yeah? Mm-hmm. But then I was watching over the, your clips, and there is a guy there who posts. Now, okay, it is good to have infrastructure, good roads, good what. But then, are we building these things so that the, 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 the hiasses, the hiasses, you know, the, the kanyaga, the one that carries dead people, yeah? Mm-hmm. Oh, <laughs> so many people to the grave. <laughs> because <Wow>. actually, <laughs> do you know that the years is called Kajaga in our in our, in our French? Yeah? <laughs> and it is it is not a very good uh, site, yeah. But although I saw in America, Kajagas are used the years are used as a as a regular car, yeah. Mm. And I love that. I love that. Now uh, let me say this, Mr. Eric, yeah. Uh-huh. Uh, the minister, wherever he is, and I know if he's not listening to the program, some guys are going to tell him, yeah, mm. that Babu Aizira said he's interacting with the ordinary people. They are the ground, the very, very ground, yeah? Yes. And the people are, people are actually desperate. Mm. They don't know how to put even food, basic food on the table. Mm. Eric, when I was growing up, yeah, mm. very quickly, let me tell you, in 1991, yeah, mm. That's when my mom passed on, yeah? Mm-hmm. And may she rest in, in peace, yeah? Amen. 
prior to her death, I remember her selling me some sugar. Mm. And I came and told her, oh, they are selling sugar at I, I think it, I remember something like 16 shillings, yeah? Mm-hmm. And uh, you can check probably in your archives how much it used to cost in 1990. A and kilo. then she said, oh, but, uh, I think it was, I, I don't know whether it was half a or what. I can't remember. Mm. But I can recollect vividly that instance, yeah? Mm-hmm. Uh, when I came back, I told her the money is not enough. Oh, she, she said, oh, what? Let me say this, yeah? Mm. The, 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 the young people are not there at that time. Mm. And uh, let me tell them that they, they, during the 1992 election, that is when this money was printed, that it was put in the economy. Mm. We have not been able to recover from, and the salaries were not increased uh, uh, proportionately, yeah? Mm. That is the time that we started having these problems. And some of the people who are uh, presenting themselves as angels to save us from, from this great mm. uh, they, 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 they are there. They are there, some of them, and I wouldn't mention the names, yeah? Mm. So let, let, let people, as we go to the, the elections next day, uh, this other, let people know. Let us lead history. Who is this person? And finally, Mr. Eric, let me tell Mr. The, our power, yes, uh, treasurer, yeah? Ukuri Atani. Ukuri Atani, Kaidri. Mm. Think about the, 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 the old people, the, the unemployed, who also needed to eat. Not mm. to have buildings, but to stay alive. Kaidri. Let the budget aim to keep people alive. And I would want you to highlight that, that, that last statement. Kaidri, Mr. Ukuri Atani, keep our people alive. <laughs> Keep them alive, especially the elderly. Yeah, Thank yeah, you very yeah, much, yeah. Zachary. Thank you. Have a nice day, guys. Cheers. Have a nice day. 0719-012-600. Alex in Homerby, you had called. Please call back. Uh, 0719-012-600. What should Okuri Atani's budget focus on mm-hmm. as the main priority areas to spend money on? What is it that we need to see being spent uh, in this particular budget? Lydia of Parklands, good morning. Good morning. Nice to hear you. Good I morning. Always to to you. I wanted to say, please um, advise Kuriatani she should reduce the trade licenses. They are killers. You know, in uh, under Muse Jomo Kenyatta, the trade license was 150 shillings paid to commerce and industry. Then the Moi re- regime did everything the cattle rustling way. They ordered that license should be paid to city council. Straight shot, 6,000. The next year, 12,000. Then 20,000. Then post-election violence, the same group came back and demanded 35,000. That's 75% increase. That's ridiculous. Mm. Then new, then additional 4,500 fire, fire prevention certificates. Yeah. yeah. This is ridiculous. They are preventing businesses from surviving. Cattle rustling style should stop completely. One ton taxation Kipaki, is wrong. That's what you're saying. Yeah. The, when Kipaki was the, pri- uh, the president on his own, mm. He made the government small, mm. but this cattle rustling group made the parliament <laughs> bloated, everything bloated, the money has lost its direction. Right. Message, you, message uh, home, uh, Lydia. Thank you very much. Alan in Kisumu. Good morning, Eric. Good morning, Alan. Uh, I think uh, there are two things. Mm. First... We are importing everything in this country. Yeah. I think uh, we should double down on uh, uh, doing the basics. Uh-huh. Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can hear you. Manufacturing uh, should be the primary focus mm. of the budget. Mm. Let's uh, eliminate these things that we are importing that is uh, pulling down the current account. That is... Uh, hiking the interest rate and all that, I think that one will contribute to reduction in unemployment. What mm-hmm. should we stop importing? Eric, we are importing everything in this country. Toothpicks, 
uh, undergarments, everything, I can assure you that. Mm. Everything that you hold in your hand there is partially imported. Mm. Very few things are manufactured here. Mm. Mm. Another thing is uh, taxation. The taxation regime that we have is so uh, punitive. Mm. I think they should uh, balance it such that it should be friendly to the local manufacturing mm -hmm. and the local businesses. I think it will balance and reduce the scourge of unemployment. Youth are suffering in this country. Mm. We are really suffering. Okay. Well, here you are, Alan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Cross over to Mombasa. Patrick, hello. Yeah, hi. How are you doing? Very Good well. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, uh, it's very interesting hearing uh, all what is happening. Yep. Contributing to the budget, uh, the issue of uh, running a business in Kenya is extremely difficult. Mm -hmm. There are too many taxation and licenses introduced. Mm. I, I am in the tourism industry, and every year I have to get about 10 licenses put in order, each with a cost before I can be approved to handle my business. Mm. When you go to the hotel, they are having 22 licenses mm. and they are very expensive, both from county and national government. Yep. My license is costed 125,000 shillings for the year 2020 to be in operational. Mm. How am I expected to recover from that? Yep. They need to do something about this. Otherwise, they are killing the business. Patrick, you. you know, we talk about yeah. this all the time. We say, you know, harmonize uh, taxes and levies, maybe yeah. reduce taxation. If you reduce taxation, how do you finance the three trillion shilling budget? But you can see that in Kenya, there is a lot of money that is going to people's pockets. Mm. This PPP you are hearing, that one P, belongs to somebody, a third cut. <laughs> one P. Uh -huh. If they can close this gap, where money is sitting away, yeah. Yeah. then we don't need to have this levy taxation. Mm. I hear you. Thank you very much, Patrick. I guess what he's saying is we don't even have to say that we are spending 3 trillion shillings, 3.3 .3 trillion shillings in a budget. No. I, I agree with that. Let's cut our size to the cloth of our size of our, of our cloth and that the coat. That thing you're trying to say, I that understand. One. Yes. Mm. And I agree. Why? Why does it, does it have to sound grand and lofty? Why does it? Is it not all right to say, okay, I mean, we're, this before. we're we an to, 11 trillion yeah. shilling economy. Ndu. How so do we, we to, finance yeah, it with just one because trillion? Of that, we just have to mm. make uh, 11 trillion economy. Now ask yourself, the elements of factors that come then mm. as derivatives of that 11 trillion, where are they? What can you see? Mm. You have to ask yourself that as well. You have to ask yourself that as Many well. Many questions. Ah. <laughs> Let's stay in Mombasa. <laughs> Dennis, hello. Uh, good morning, uh, despite the empty. Good, good morning. morning, Dennis. Thank you. Uh, it was my first try and I got through. Karim. No. Hey. The, the, way, the way when I look uh, at this situation of the budget mm. uh, and what I've had comments people make, it's quite clear we, we are a confused house. That is Kenya. Mm -hmm. And you know when you have a confused house, what you need to do is get everything out of the house, yeah. mm -hmm. rearrange your furniture. Mm -hmm. That means you throw away a lot of, a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And when if I was the some. Minister for Finance, mm -hmm. yes, throw away, sell some and all that. Mm -hmm. And the thing that we need to throw away, you know, is through the, the electoral process. Mm -hmm. But we're not very good at it. Mm -hmm. So this is where our problem is. Uh, as Kenyans, we really need to look for leaders who are really keen to, to, to have a change in the way we do things. Because we can talk about all these things. And I can tell you, for example, all this that my friend Patrick has just said about licenses. We know we need to build dams so that we can have water. Uh, and uh, health will be affected, mm. for sure, if, if we have enough supply of water. Some of these diseases that we suffer from, and those health uh, budgets that, that are so high and ridiculous, mm. they will be dealt with. We know what we are supposed to do. We don't have to uh, term the entire country. We can say, hey, okay, from the main arteries, let's go 10 kilometers into the interior. Let's just have good surface road that we are able to maintain, not at a very high cost. Let's cut our cloth, uh, our cloth according to, 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 to what we have. Mm. But the problem is the people who manage all this is the problem. Mm. So we can do all renovations. But if, you're, if the tenant is just going to be the same one when he comes home drunk, he, he spits <laughs> over the walls and things like that, this is what you're going to get. Yeah. So, importantly, for me, if you ask me, uh, I would say 
let him put the money in putting up prisons because that's that's the, that's the, that's the way we do the cleanup. We need to jail a lot of people for this country to make sense. It will not happen with the same people. We can write all papers and we can put all theories that we want mm. over this situation. It will never change. Mm. It's, it's the people. The problem is not the ideas. It's not the, the plans we have. And for sure, I always keep wondering these days, who is the minister for planning, if I may ask? Does anybody know? Yep. Ukuri Atani. <laughs> He's a minister for planning. Yes, oh, National Treasury and Planning. planning. <laughs> All right, that is the reason why. You see, there, there, in, you see, there, there, there is no check. There is no check. Because I remember when, when Anyang Nyong was the minister for planning, yeah. that was a quite a luminary in that aspect. Mm. There was proper planning and he consulted and there was, there was, you could see that something was important. And for Kibaki's government, the way it performed stellarly is because they had a minister of planning who was also important. It's just not a minister of finance because mm. that guy just appropriates and all money goes into waste. Mm. We can have good ideas, like I say, put dams, I spend billions, but as you know, today no one is talking about dams and then we're talking about food security. Mm. Why? Because money was stolen. So that's the end of the story. We will always have this crisis. Let's have people who can do the right thing. Thanks, De- ladies. Dennis, let me ask you. Uh, Dennis, yes, sir. do you think yes, sir. we need a 3.3 trillion shilling budget? No, no, not not really. We are wasting a lot of it. Because you see, the, the problem is we are just increasing the appetite and, the, and enlarging the stomachs of those who steal. <laughs> we know, like, for example, the, the president said clearly, two billion shillings goes to waste every day. Yeah. Can you tell me what, uh, can you imagine what two billion shillings can do? Mm, indeed. If it was properly used. It's mm. a lot. You don't need that. And, and, and the other thing that I really cry for, and uh, I really shudder to think when people keep saying, we need to send money to the counties. Mm. That is a lot of hogwash. These guys just spy. This, you have just created 47 thieves whom you are insisting that they get this money. Until and up to when we have audit systems that will take care of that. Uh. Let's not send any money to the... We don't need to increase that to 35%. These, they, these are just cartels. And that's why these groupings will always be there. We are not being sincere as Kenyans. Oh. We know our money is being stolen left, right and center. In this county where I live for 10 years, I can say there's little that I can show, apart from red pavements, and that is what is called development. Not a single hospital has been built in the district, uh, in, in the, in the sub-county level, uh. to, to alleviate the health problem. So what are we talking about when we're saying we want to deal with health? We want to deal... Look at the water crisis in Mombasa. For 10 years, there's nothing that you can say substantive has been done or seems, or seems to appear to be happening. Mm. So it, it's about leadership. The money has been sent over the years. I don't have the numbers, but it is quite clear. Mm. When you hear the figures, you wonder, really, are you talking about this much money? Have you been sent in the water sector in this, in this part of town? Mm. And yet there is, there is not a single drop of water that comes. Everybody has bo- a borehole here in this town. Come on. Hmm. Big it, issues. It's not, don't send money to the county before we make proper changes to the people who do the governance of these places. We need that. So my suggestion to, your theory, uh, to the Minister of Finance, let him plan for more prisons. Let him plan for more prosecutors. That's the direction that we should take. Deal with that first. Then the cleanup will take place. Thank Otherwise, you. the rest of the things is just a, a, a hypothesis. Thank you, Dennis. Thanks. Have a good day. Two words. Radical reform. Yeah. That's it. Radical reform. Uh, that's what he's saying, Dennis, here. Mm. Is that here you are, you know, flirting with the idea that, oh, there's corruption, but you don't really want to land this plane, right? Mm. We deal with it here and there when we can. We can give some lofty numbers here. But you're not really ready to hit the nail on the head. When you hit the nail on the head, likely you get a block in place and you can see your building is rising. Isn't that what it is? Hit the and to the next, and to the next. <laughs> Radical reform yes. has to start with the people. Uh, okay? You don't expect the same person who's been implementing what they've been implementing for three how long to suddenly be a reformist. <laughs> so if we haven't... If had, you haven't been a reformist from the get-go, forget <laughs> it. It's not going to change. Yeah. So we've got to be radical reformists, we as the people, in this election and decide, do we want to elect leaders that are going to hold the executive to account strictly or are we going to have members of parliament for example who are going to sit there and say yeah 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 we're at party cdf and that's all mm. they move in or who will be coming to this show and telling us 
you know, you know, we really, we, in fact, I was telling my, my fellow MPs, you know, Mweshimu was so and so, you know, this parliament, you know, if we didn't have, you know, you know, we've been captured. <laughs> we have no choice. You know, for example, the other day, somebody got a call. We were talking about this in the, in the budget committee. And we started asking questions and somebody got a call or somebody had to step out and ask and make a call and say, you know, so and so we have seen an issue here. What do you think? Should we pass? Should we not? The reformists, the people that you think should be radical reformists. Those are the ones. You and I. It's a you and I. Don't expect it to be anybody. It's not, it's not going to be Ukuri Atani. It's not going to be Raila Odinga, William Ruto or John Badi. It is not. It's you. It's, it's you, you and I. Dennis is talking about water. Yes, it's a big problem. Not just in uh, Mombasa, it's a big problem everywhere mm. in terms of water provision, water in uh, counties, water in in uh, various areas. So, Colgate just looked at that issue of water and they decided, you know what, uh, we have dealt with this one for a while and they went to several counties, seven counties. Kisumu, Siaya, Kakamega, Migori, Kwale, Kitui, and Homa Bay. And they went into various schools. They sunk 90 wells in collaboration with Well Boring, which is a UK NGO. They've sunk 90 wells. And those wells are not only supporting the local uh, the school itself, but they are supporting the communities. Mm. When you have a well in your area, and this area has been having perennial water shortages, you're making sure that there's closer access for water by the people. Life-changing, situation-changing I mean, potentially overturning situations mm. whereby you take care of so many things, hitting so many things with one stone. Health issues, you know, uh, drinking water issues, cooking issues, sanitation issues, all at once. So, you know, it sounds really easy, but it really is. If you buy a tube of toothpaste, a Colgate toothpaste, you're guaranteeing that in the 30 boreholes would have been sunk mm. uh, over the next... Uh, you know, future period, and so that more people's lives can be changed with the provision of water. Indeed. And thanks, thanks a lot to Colgate and Well Boring for that work. Thank you for tuning in to Kenya's Biggest Conversation. So tomorrow is Yatani Day. We'll be here having more conversations about what to expect from Okuri Yatani. On Friday, we'll be sitting here and saying, Okuri Yatani is telling us to start paying tax for air. And there's not enough revenue. Hey, and we'll be making noise. <laughs> Keep it here for more entertainment sugar and spice and everything nice it's 10 a.m good day spice up your life the latest news from around the world 94.4 spice fm This is Newswire, I'm Dennis Aseto. The Kenyan National Commission on Human Rights has facilitated the formulation of county action plans that will ensure that residents of the arid counties of Marsabed and Garissa have access to water as a primary human right. KNCHR Deputy Director.